your attention, we'll call the Metropolitan Planning Commission to order for the February 24th, 2022 meeting. We'll call the meeting to order. I appreciate everybody coming down here. Um, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, first is, uh, as you saw the signs entering the building, we encourage you to wear your mask. It's not mandatory, but encouraged. We appreciate that. Um, also, please silent your phones if you can uh, as we conduct uh, our meeting. Also, um, I'm going to, uh, commissioners, if, if you'll abide by me a little bit, give me some leeway, and I'm going to go out of order. But we, I have a special announcement um, that, you know, I'm kind of sad about it, but I, I want to say that this is actually going to be um, Commissioner Sims, Dr. Pearl Sims' last meeting. And um, we really, really appreciate uh, your service, Dr. Sims. Um, she is an extremely passionate member of the commission. Uh, she loves this community, has a deep love for Nashville, and she has a prowessness for numbers and data that uh, she's helped the commission with. Um, she's never afraid to, to voice her opinion. Uh, and so we, I just want to take a moment to just say with a deep and heavy heart that uh, we appreciate your service to the city and if everybody give them her a round of applause. <laughs> and then uh, since uh, the director, so uh, since the director is leaving at the last case, uh, we want to present a plaque to you, Commissioner, and get a picture. So we're gonna do that right here in the front, if that's okay. We'll have all the commissioners come in the front so we can get you a picture and present you a plaque. Thank you, everybody, for taking the time to do that. That's really important. She's been a really important member of our um, commission for a long time. So we are now on to the adoption of the agenda. Commissioners, that agenda was sent to you beforehand. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and the agenda is adopted. We're on to the approval of the February 10th, 2022 minutes under item C, which was also sent to you earlier. Is there a motion to adopt the minutes? There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, all in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it and the minutes are adopted. Now we're on to the recognition of the council members. And, and um, I just, we as we see you come in, this is the order. So I saw... Councilmember Swope first. Where do you, do you want to come on up, Councilman, or do you want to wait for your? Thank you, Councilman. Appreciate you coming in. Next, we saw Council Lady Berkeley Allen. You want to come come on up? Welcome. Thanks for coming. Yeah, you got to push the button. I found it. Thank you, commissioners. I appreciate the opportunity to speak, and I appreciate 
the work that y'all do. I was Dr. Sims' neighbor when I sat over where Council Member Withers now, and we were a power team. Um, so I, I know uh, what wisdom she has brought to this commission, and I, I share your regret at losing her. So, um, and I know how hard y'all all work. I'm here to uh, ask for your approval of two items on your agenda, uh, and I apologize for not knowing numbers. I know how helpful that is. Uh, one is uh, the dark skies bill, and that one simply um, moves the authority for, for variance appeals away from the codes department, who um, is not very well equipped to deal with it, to the BCA, which makes more sense. That was a request of the codes department. Um, I believe it's on consent. And the second is, I believe, item number nine, um, which is inclusionary housing. Um, that is a, a, a tool of one of the many that we are trying to create uh, that will enable developers to provide um, some units within a multifamily apartment complex that would be set aside for income qualified tenants. This particular tool would uh, apply only in the downtown code area and it would uh, include uh, uh, having some affordable units as one of the, the public goods that you can provide to, to get the density bonus in the downtown code, similar to extra parking or wraparound parking or green space that it would be added to that menu of goods that you can offer. Um, this has been, uh, was, we created a similar tool for all of Nashville many years ago, which was unfortunately preempted by the state. Uh, and this includes very specific language that sets this up so that the developer or the owner of the apartment actually is working through a master lease agreement with MDHA or another approved third party, and they are paid the regular market rate rent. So by, by setting it up in this way, we're not violating any state laws, and we're um, able to, uh, to provide a mechanism then for MDHA to income qualified tenants and enable them to live in areas of opportunity where the jobs are and to cut down on transit costs, which is one of the things we desperately need. So um, I hope that you will uh, give that your strong consideration, and I would ask for your approval for, for both of those. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Lady. And the um, dark skies was item number eight. Item then, number eight. And then the other one was item number nine. Thank you, Council Lady. Appreciate you coming in. Next, I saw Councilman Parker. Let's see. Okay, thank you, Councilman. Appreciate you coming in. Any other council members? I want to make sure I don't miss anybody. Sometimes I, it's hard to tell with masks. Okay, I didn't see anybody. If we see a council member come in, we'll let them speak. All right, so now um, we are on to items, uh, item number E, item E, which is items for deferral withdrawal. Lisa, are you going to take us through those items? I am. Uh, the following items are for deferral or withdrawal. On page three of your agenda, item 1A, 2021 CP 008003, North Nashville Community Plan Amendment. Staff recommendation is to defer to the March 10th meeting. The associated case 1B, 2021 SP 044001, Germantown Green. Staff recommendation is to defer to the March 10th meeting. On page four of your agenda, item number two, 2021 SP 057001, Marina Grove. Staff recommendation is to defer to the March 10th meeting. Item number three, 2021 SP 063001, Charlotte View West. Staff recommendation is to defer to the March 10th meeting. Item number four, 2021 SP 081001, Oliveri Mixed Use. Staff recommendation is to defer to the March 24th meeting, and that was an update from the previously published agenda. Item number five, 2022 SP 010001, Overland Park SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the March 10th meeting. Item number six, 2022 S 025001, Over Street Subdivision. Staff recommendation is to defer to the March 10th meeting. Item number seven on page five of your agenda, 2022S042001, Rosebank Subdivision Resubdivision of Lot 29. Staff recommendation is to defer to the March 10th meeting. On page six of your agenda, item number 15, 2021SP095001, 2600 Dickerson Pike. Staff recommendation is to defer to the March 10th meeting. 
On page eight of your agenda, item number 21, 2021Z077PR001, a rezoning request on Cowden Avenue. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Item number 26, 2022Z024PR001, a rezoning request on Old Hickory Boulevard. Staff recommendation is to defer to the March 10th meeting. That's it. Mr. Chair, uh, sorry, I wanted to um, just confirm with staff, I, I believe we did re uh, receive correspondence recently from Councilman Hall for item 29. Um, uh, could you read that uh, letter into the record? It was not sent from the council office, um, but it is requesting a deferral. So give us just a moment and we will. It looks like there was a, an email to our, the Planning Commissioner's website deferring, but there was a there was an odd sort of time on the email that said 7:04 p.m. today. So I was trying to confirm with the council member um, that he was uh, asking for a deferral. So I haven't heard back from him yet. So we we weren't going to put it, it on the deferral. Okay. List would yet. it be appropriate since um, it's the last item for us to continue <clears throat> to try to reach him? And I do think since the staff is recommending deferral with. Um, our legal counsel's urging that we could give the commission an update subsequently. Is that our plan? Okay. Right. Yes, Director, that sounds good. We'll, we'll do these first, and then we can always go back to that. Like you said, it's the last item, so that's a good idea. All right, so, commissioners, you've heard the items for deferral. We'll go through these real quick. And Lisa, make sure I'm we're correct. So we'll go slow, make sure everybody knows which items these are. So items for deferral are items 1A, 1B, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 15, 21, and 26. Is that correct? That's correct. All right, commissioners, you've heard the items for deferral. Is there a motion? There's a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. And now we are on to the consent agenda. Item F, Lisa. Items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. I will read through the items that are on tentative consent, and I will ask if there is anyone in the audience that is in opposition to any of these items. If there is anyone in opposition to the items, please raise your hand, and the item will be presented. The following items are on tentative consent. Item number 8, 2020Z014TX003, Dark Skies Amendment. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 8? Item number 9, 2021Z013TX001, a text amendment related to inclusionary housing. Is there anyone in opposition to item 9? Item number 10, 2022, I'm sorry, 2020CP013001, a community plan amendment in Antioch Priest Lake. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 10? Item number 11, 20. 10 SP 005003 Gillespie I Care SP. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 11? Item number 12, 2021 SP 068001 South Street North SP. Is there anyone in opposition to item 12? Item 13A, 2021 SP 083001 and 13B, 2003P 015005, Meridian Street Development. Is there anyone in opposition to items 13A and 13B? Opposition? Hey, Councilman, can you come, come up to the, so we can just get it on the record of what you're requesting. Uh, thank you, Commissioners. Um, so 
this is, um, I don't know that there's anyone here in direct opposition. I didn't see any hands, but I think there are folks who would like to comment on it, um, if, if that's all right. It is, if but we, we, we have to consent. open the hearing for the public hearing to do that. Yes. Okay. So can we remove we'll it from do that. the consent calendar? Thank you. Yep. Item number 14, 2021 SP 092001 Dodson Chapel. Is there anyone in opposition to item 14? Item 14 will be presented. Item number 16, 2021 SP 096001 1301 2nd Avenue North. Is there anyone in opposition to item 16? Item 17, 2022 SP 003001 Edenwald SP. Is there anyone in opposition to item 17? Item number 18, 2022 SP 007001 Bluff Heights. Is there anyone in opposition? We'll present that item. Item number 19, 2022 SP 015001 1400 Brick Church SP. Is there anyone in opposition to item number 19? Item number 20, 2022HL002001, 915 Kirkwood. Is there anyone in opposition to item 20? Item number 22, 2022Z008PR001, a rezoning on 24th Avenue North. Is there anyone in opposition to item 22? Item number 23, 2022Z010PR001, a rezoning on Cumberland Bend. Is there anyone in opposition to 23? Item number 24, 2022Z015PR001, a rezoning on Meharry Boulevard. Is there anyone in opposition to item 24? Item number 25, 2022Z020PR001, a rezoning on Monticello Drive. Is there anyone in opposition to item 25? Item number 27, 2022Z028PR001, a rezoning on 24th Avenue North. Is there anyone in opposition to item 27? Item 28, 2022S039001, Interstate Park South Resub Lot 10. Is there anyone in opposition to item 28? Okay, Chairman, I'll go through and read those captions now. As information for our audience, if you are not satisfied with the decision made by the Planning Commission today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the entry of the Planning Commission's decision. To ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact independent legal counsel. The following items are on the consent agenda. On page five of your agenda, item number eight, 2020Z014TX003, it's a request to amend various sections of the zoning code related to uh, design and operation of outdoor electrical lighting. Staff recommendation is to approve amendments to title 17. Item number nine, 2021Z013TX001. It's a request for an ordinance to amend various sections of the zoning code related to inclusionary housing. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 10, 2020CP013001, Antioch Priest Lake Community Plan Amendment. It's a request to amend the Antioch Priest Lake Community Plan by changing from district office concentration to suburban neighborhood maintenance and suburban mixed-use corridor for properties located on Murfreesboro Pike. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 11, 2010 SP 005003 Gillespie Eye Care. It's a request to amend a specific plan to permit the addition of 2,000 square feet to an existing eye care facility. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. On page six of your agenda, item number 12, 2021 SP 068001, South Street North. It's a request to rezone from R6A to SP for a property located on South Street to permit four multifamily units. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. On page seven of your agenda, item number 16, 2021 SP 096001, 
1301 2nd Avenue North. It's a request to rezone from IR to SP for property located on 2nd Avenue North to permit hotel and retail uses. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 17, 2022 SP 003001, Edenwald SP. It's a request to rezone from CS to SP for property located on Edenwald Road to permit auto repair and warehouse. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 19, 2022 SP 015001, 1400 Brick Church Pike SP. It's a request to rezone from CL to SP for property located on Brick Church Pike to permit a mixed use development. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 20, 2022 HL 002001. 915 Kirkwood Historic Landmark Overlay. It's a request to apply a historic landmark overlay to portion of property located at 915 Avenue, 915 Kirkwood Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve. On page eight of your agenda, item number 22, 2022 Z008PR001. It's a request to rezone from R6 to RM15ANS for property located on 24th Avenue North. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item 23, 2022Z010PR001. It's a request to rezone from IWD to MUGNS for property located on Cumberland Bend. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 24, 2022Z015PR001. It's a request to rezone from RS5 to R6A for property located on Harry Boulevard. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 25, 2022Z020PR001. It's a request to rezone from RS7.5 to R8 for property located on Monticello Drive. Staff recommendation is to approve. On page nine of your agenda, item number 27, 2022Z028PR001. It's a request to rezone from IWD to OR20NS for property located on 24th Avenue North. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 28, 2022S039001, Interstate Park South Resub of Lot 10. It's a request to amend a previously approved plat to reduce the platted front setback. Staff recommendation is to approve. And under other business, item number 30, employee contract renewal for Eric Hammer and Harriet Brooks. And item number 34, to accept the director's report. Thank you, Lisa. So, commissioners, the items that are now on the consent agenda are items number 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 16, 17, 19, 20, 22, 23, 24, 25, 27, 28, 30, and 34. Is that correct, Lisa? Yes. All right, commissioners, you've heard the items on the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve? There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and those items are approved on the consent agenda. So that leaves us to considering on the public hearing tonight, I believe this is right, Lisa, is 13A, 13B, 14, 18, and 29. Is that correct? I have, Bob has an update yeah, on we, 29. I did confirm with Council Member Hall that he does want to defer item 29 to eight, a meeting in April, and I think it would be the second meeting in April would allow it to go to the May public hearing at Council. So he didn't specify which meeting in April, but I think if we put it on the second meeting in April, that would still allow it to move forward for the May public hearing. All right, Commissioner, so... Do you, do you want me to read that caption? Into yes, the, Lisa, uh, would the, you... Yes. And if, if, ever, if I could get everybody's attention, if we could get everybody that's finished their business to exit the room quietly, we appreciate it. Thank you very much. Sorry to say that. Sure. But I, we appreciate it. All right, so Lisa... Yes. An item 29. An additional item for deferral, item number 29, 2022Z003 PR001. It's a request to rezone from IR to OL for property located on Jenny Brown Lane. Staff recommendation is to defer to the April 28th meeting. All right, so let's get a motion to do that just because it's out of order. Uh, is there a motion to defer item 29? So moved. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? 
Seeing no discussion, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. Item 29 is added to the deferrals. To the second meeting in April. Okay. All right. So, commissioners, the items, uh, and for all of the public, uh, the items that we are um, going to consider tonight are 13A, 13B, 14, and 18. Those four items. Is that correct, Lisa? Sorry, yes, that's correct. Okay. And then I believe that uh, Commissioner Henley is recusing himself on 13A and B. Is that correct, Commissioner? In, yes, okay. All right, so 13A and B. Oh, so, ma'am, thank you for uh, being here today. We are pulling up the presentation, and so uh, this is how it works, guys. Uh, no, no, look, this is a good question. So, so some of you uh, come down here often, and a lot of you do not. And so this is how it works. Uh, the items left will be a public hearing. Uh, we'll do the presentation, open up the public hearing, um, the applicant will get 10 minutes to speak, and then uh, everyone else uh, gets two minutes uh, to speak in support and then two minutes to speak in opposition, okay? We try to keep everything professional. You always address the chair. Um, try not to um, disparage anybody's name, and we'll let you know if you do that. Um, and so we appreciate everybody coming down. And then the, the applicant will have a rebuttal. And then the council member will speak. And then we'll close the public hearing, have a discussion, and vote on that item, OK? So thank you for asking that. I usually go over that. I apologize. Uh, and so we are ready for the presentation. All right, here we go. Okay, can everybody hear me? All right. Um, commissioners, I am presenting the following items, 13A and 13B. Um, they will be presented together as they are associated cases, um, but please note that each case will require a separate motion. Um, the first of these items is 13A, the Meridian Street Development SP. This is a request to rezone from RM20 to a specific plan, mixed use, for properties located at 301 North 2nd Street and 651 and 660 Joseph Avenue at the northeastern corner of Dickerson Pike and Meridian Street and located in a PUD overlay to permit a mixed use development with non-residential uses and a maximum of 1,150 multifamily residential units. Um, the site is approximately 14.52 acres. Um, and for reference, it's located north of the intersection of Spring Street and Dickerson Pike, east of I-24. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. The site includes approximately 4.5 acres and is located along Dickerson Pike, Meridian Street, and forming the south side of Grace Street, east of Joseph Avenue. Sorry, Joseph Avenue. The site is bounded by an existing alley network at the rear. Barry Street, which is an existing local street to the east, terminates into the eastern boundary of the site. Uh, the site is outlined in, in blue on this screen, and um, this kind of gives an indication of the existing road network in the area. So North First Street, um, which runs under Interstate 24, crosses with Dickerson Pike along the western boundary. Um, between the site and Interstate 24. The street crossing is represented by the red X on the screen. Um, Buffalo Park is located on the north side of this crossing uh, within the divided median. And for reference, the Salvation Army site is located um, at the northwest corner south of Grace Street. 
The site includes three parcels that were previously developed as part of a PUD, with several low-rise multifamily residential structures that wrap Meridian Street, Dickerson Pike, and Grace Street. The McFerrin, McFerrin Park neighborhood is located to the east and is characterized by an urban residential development pattern with smaller lots um, and single family, two family, and multifamily residential properties. The site is located in several uh, urban, urban policy areas as well as the Dickerson South Corridor study, which includes supplemental guidance for development in the Dickerson Pike area. I will re revisit these land use policies um, a little bit later in this presentation. This slide uh, represents the existing site conditions and road alignments. So the proposed SP is designed to accommodate various TDOT and Nashville DOT plans for the Dickerson Corridor, including the opportunity for Dickerson Pike to be realigned where it currently crosses with North First Street. Therefore, the SP includes two plan options to account for the possibility of different transit scenarios along Dickerson Pike. Option one retains a current alignment of Dickerson Pike where no changes are proposed to the North, um, North First Street crossing. And option two proposes realignment of Dickerson Pike and removal of the crossing. So this is the first option. Uh, you can see how it retains the existing alignment of Dickerson Pike. And then it also proposes to wrap Berry Street um, to the north to Joseph Avenue. So under this scenario, there's no change to the existing alignment of Dickerson Pike. And this is the second option, uh, which removes the Dickerson Pike North First Street cross and realigns Dickerson Pike along a curve that tees directly into North First Street, south of Berry Street. Under this scenario, Berry Street extends from its current terminus to the west, connecting straight through to nor North First Street, and Dickerson Pike would become a two-lane road between Spring Street, which is to the south, and North First Street. Staff requested both plan options be submitted to planning for a full evaluation of the traffic implications under the current conditions and with the realignment to understand which option would be more appropriate from a traffic and pedestrian standpoint. Uh, to give an overview of the SP, there will, it's proposed with a maximum of 1,150 multifamily residential units and all uses permitted by MUGA with the exception of STRP, um, owner and not owner occupied, which will be prohibited. Uh, the maximum floor area ratio is 3.0, excluding uh, any area used for parking. Both plan options include six development nodes. Um, <clears throat> each node includes varying height standards as depicted in the um, proposed massing diagrams, which I will share a little bit later. In general, the massing and the heights step down um, from west to east, so they step down away from the corridor. And both options propose a nearly identical um, development footprint within the SP boundary, with the exception of the treatment of Barry Street. So here's the first option, uh, which is the no build scenario. So Dickerson Pike is over to the west, um, where it's pro proposed to be retained in the current configuration. Sites A and B are located on the northern end, and then sites C, D, and E are located to the south, with site F um, located at the southeastern corner along Meridian Street. So under this scenario, Barry Street, which is in here, is proposed to wrap to the north. Uh, this is the second plan option reflecting the realignment of Dickerson Pike. Um, development nodes A through F are located in the same location. And um, you can see here that Barry Street punches through to North First Street to the west here. And then you can see here where Dickerson kind of forms um, a T to Dickerson to first, North First Street. Um, I'll now review the development details with each plan option. So beginning with sites A and B on the north end, site A is located east of Joseph Avenue over here and includes buildings with um, a maximum of three stories and surface parking at the rear. Site B, so located in front of site A, is located west of Joseph Avenue um, and includes a six-story building that um, near the corridor. So for option one, um, the six-story building at Site B wraps, wraps Dickerson Pike, um, which fronts the corridor, and then it also fronts a courtyard proposed to the south. Um, retaining this area as open space would allow an opportunity for a future connection to Dickerson. Option two, on the right side, um, 
shows the six story building fronting um, the Berry Street extension rather than the courtyard. Um, so the building is located in the same uh, location as option one, but it does sit a little further back due to the realignment. This is site C, so we're moving further south um, on the opposite side of Berry Street. And site C includes a six story building um, that includes an internal parking garage. The parking is wrapped with residential uses on all sides, except for the uh, rear facade which is highlighted in, in yellow. A central courtyard separates the main building from a residential liner building to the rear, um, adjacent to the alley. So the fifth story of the liner building, so the, the liner building is five stories and it steps down to four at the back, and then it steps down again on the northern end to um, two stories. For option one, the main building wraps the corridor and forms the southern boundary of the courtyard. And for option two, um, the main building and the liner building both front Berry Street, which um, punches through to the west. Sites D and E are located further south, and they include uh, the same plan scenario. Maximum heights are proposed to be six stories, with the exception of the portion of the corner of Meridian and Dickerson down here, where um, heights uh, are proposed to be 10 stories. Each site includes an internal parking garage that is wrapped by liners on all sides. Site F is the only node that is located away from the corridor on the north side of Meridian, so it's this corner here. Um, it includes heights of two, three, and four stories, and um, also proposes to extend North 2nd Street, which is an existing street here, um, to the south to connect to Meridian Street. Massing models were provided to demonstrate the overall massing and building height. So we're now rotated with Dickerson Pike on the bottom and Grace Street on the left side. And then the sides move from A to F from left to right. The structured parking areas are shown in pink and red. Um, they are screened, uh, they are wrapped with liners or other activated um, habitable space to hide views of the garage from the streets. Um, the, the only exception to this is at site C here where you see a purple line. This facade will not be lined, but it will be um, treated with architectural treatments as proposed with the SP. And then here is the massing option, uh, Meissen diagram for option two, which is nearly identical. Uh, you can see that Barry Street, which is here, comes through to North First Street. Um, pedestrian access will be provided uh, from the public sidewalks along the street frontages, street frontages and internal to the site, and architectural standards including materials, glazing, and parking garage treatments are included in the SP plan. The site is located in the urban mixed-use corridor, urban neighborhood evolving. Uh, policies and is also within the Dickerson South Corridor study, which includes supplemental guidance for development in this area. The supplemental policy established a building heights subdistrict um, policy for the area, which gives guidance on appropriate building heights and zoning districts um, that are intended to create a pattern of development that would be supported by the applicable subdistrict. Um, so the site is, in lo is located in, in several subdistricts, um, including a T4 neighborhood evolving subdistrict, which supports heights of up to three stories, and this is the location of site A. A uh, neighborhood evolving subdistrict which supports heights of up to four stories, which is site F. And then a mixed use corridor urban policy which supports heights of six stories, which is site B, site D, E, sorry, B, C, D, and E, um, with um, permitting punctuations of taller heights at the corner of Meridian and Dickerson. So the height limits specified by the subdistricts contain guidance for appropriate uh, zoning districts that would align with the height and development intensity expected for the area. 
Uh, the site is located at the entrance of the McFerrin Park neighborhood along a major corridor, Dickerson Pike, which is poised to serve as an important multimodal corridor for Nashville. The plan proposes redevelopment of underutilized properties into a mixed-use development along a major thoroughfare where there is an expressed interest providing additional intensity along the corridor that carefully transitions to the um, surrounding neighborhood. The site plan includes development that frames the corridor with heights that step down to the interior neighborhood, forming an appropriate transition in scale. Regarding the treatment of Dickerson Pike, Nashville DOT has evaluated both plan options to better understand the traffic and pedestrian implications, and staff's preference is for option two, which is the build realignment of Dickerson Pike, with the understanding that the final realignment will be determined at final SP review in conjunction with NDOT and TDOT subject to staff conditions in the report. If the realignment is not approved by TDOT, adjustments may be necessary to the site plan, including but not limited to building placement and the relationship um, to the streets. Pedestrian entries and street level interaction will need to be demonstrated um, with the final site plan, regardless of the final alignment de determination. Other improvements that will enhance the street network include the extension of North 2nd Street, uh, to Meridian Street, and then um, the extension of Barry Street to North First, uh, which is identified in option two, but is also viable in option one. These enhancements will improve the street network and support the additional intensity called for by the Dickerson South Corridor study. And um, it's important to note that this plan also meets several critical goals, including for street activation that prior prioritizes pedestrian and um, tree-lined streetscapes in place of head-in parking and driveway access points that have long dominated the Dickerson Pike Corridor. Um, staff finds the plan to, be, um, to meet several goals and consistent with the policies and therefore recommends approval with conditions and disapproval without all conditions. Thank you, Abby. And so we'll open this item for pub Chair, forgive oh. me for interrupting. Did we want to go ahead and hear the We want to go ahead and hear the, yes, we do. 3B, 13B, yes. yes. Same public Sorry, opinion. I was getting That's ahead okay. of myself. I'm this sorry, one, Chair. This one will be a lot shorter, so. Okay. Um, <laughs> the second part is uh, 13B, which is um, a request to cancel the existing PUD on the site. Um, so again, we are at 301 North 2nd Street six, and 651 and 660 Joseph Avenue. The base zoning district is RM20. Staff recommendation is to approve if the associated SP is approved and disapprove if the associated SP is not approved. Um, this area was part of an older residential, residential E PUD. So these Res E PUDs were adopted in the 70s prior to our current zoning code. Um, the PUD permits multifamily residential units and was, at this site, was developed with several low-rise um, multifamily residential structures. Other portions of the PUD has, have been canceled over the years. Staff finds the PUD cancellation request to be consistent with the land use policies. Um, cancellation of this portion of the PUD will allow more opportunities for the properties to redevelop in a manner that is consistent with the T4 urban transect. Um, where the policies support a greater mix of higher density residential and non-residential uses. Therefore, staff recommends approval if the associated SP is approved and disapproval if the associated SP is not approved. This concludes my presentation. Thank you, Abby, and sorry I was jumping the gun there. So, commissioners, you know in these types of cases we'll uh, do the public hearing for both, and then we'll we'll vote on them separately when we get to that. Okay, so we'll we'll open the item, the public hearing on both 13A and 13B. Thank you for the presentation, Abby. Good job. And as a reminder, uh, the applicant gets 10 minutes, and you can save two minutes of the 10 for rebuttal. Come on up. Welcome. button to press no no you can talk and try to okay. talk uh hi uh thank you to the commission for having me my name is victor young i'm a principal at cypress real estate advisors based out of austin texas uh i've been pleased to get to know your city pretty well over the last year i think this is my 14th trip um 
I'd like to thank the Planning Commission for uh, welcoming us, uh, particularly Commissioner Kempf, although she has left the <laughs> her seat. Uh, we've been working pretty diligently with her staff over the last 10 months. I'd like to thank Councilman Parker, uh, who, when I was speaking with him yesterday, mentioned that he had attended at least 20 meetings uh, on this project, I think most of which predate my involvement, but uh, I'm always impressed by the uh, uh, diligence with which you represent your constituents and, and the job that you do. Uh, I'd also like to thank the McFerrin Park Neighborhood Association, Ingrid Campbell and its executive committee, the East Bank Work Group, including members of Stand Up Nashville, NOAA, the Equity Alliance, and others, the MDHA, NDOT, and TDOT, all of whom we've spoken with. Uh, we wouldn't be here without the work of our team of local experts, including Hawkins Partners, Hastings Architecture, Pillars Development, KCI, Barge Coth, and Hardaway, Alliance Synergy Group, and Terracon. Uh, and most importantly, I'm incredibly thankful to have the support and expertise of our nonprofit partners at the Salvation Army and PATH, along with the insight of Eddie Latimer of Affordable Housing Solutions. Uh, so when we first began working on the River Chase Apartments about a year ago, uh, it was apparent there was a lot, a lot of work to do. Uh, and that work included not just typical land planning decisions, uh, but instead, the majority of our efforts have been crucial engagement with community leaders to develop a plan that provides much needed housing stock to East Nashville and addresses the issue of affordable housing head on. To wit, we held five public meetings with the McFerrin Park Neighborhood Association, and we are grateful for their collaboration and insight. Along with this engagement, CREA has made significant donations to the MPNA, and as a part of this specific uh, proposed specific plan, we have pledged future funding for traffic calming and community benefits totaling $140,000. Most importantly, our engagement with the MPNA and others opened our eyes to the circumstances of existing River Chase residents and the displacement issues that they faced. So prior to even closing on the purchase of the property, we began providing housing relocation and financial assistance to all River Chase residents through a precedent-setting program with the Salvation Army, Freeman Webb, our property manager, and Jackie Sims at PATH. An important tenant of that program, and the one that we are most proud of, is that qualifying legacy, legacy residents will have the right to return to the redeveloped property when it's complete without having to break through any of the typical barriers that new developments often put in place. And while the work we've done regarding affordability is critical, and has been the focus of our efforts. I'm also very proud of the work our land planners have performed. To start, uh, as was presented earlier, the plan fits 100% inside of the agreed upon policy that was established by the Dickerson South Corridor study uh, in February of 2020 for this parcel. We are not asking for any height variances, and we have even implemented design choices that were reviewed earlier that steps down height throughout the entire 15 acres to respect the single fair, uh, family character of McFerrin Park. The result of this plan is up to 1,150 units of multifamily housing that includes at least, or that includes 220 units of affordable and workplace ho workforce housing that we pledge to preserve for at least 30 years. Those units will provide multiple options of housing types from three bedroom units all the way down to studios, making it a community that is appropriate for diverse occupants. Additionally, the project will incorporate a broad range of community benefits, including dedicating private land for the improved street network, a streetscape that is designed to enhance the pedestrian and bicycle experience and safety of the neighborhood, 1.25 acres of publicly accessible outdoor and green space, an increased tree canopy, neighborhood-focused re retail, and a commitment to public art. Regarding mobility, we are hopeful that TDOT and NDOT will approve, I'm, I'm sorry, we are hopeful that TDOT will approve the NDOT preferred plan that incorporates the realignment of Dickerson Pike to help optimize pedestrian and neighborhood safety at what is today a high-speed and dangerous intersection. By realigning Dickerson, we would convert about a third mile stretch from a high-speed corridor to a pedestrian and bike-friendly boulevard with a neighborhood focus that meets the goals of our neighborhood. Lastly, the potential to reconnect Berry Street with Dickerson returns McFerrin Park to its historic block structure and provides increased connectivity for the neighborhood. 
So we're really pleased with the work that we've done. We're really pleased with our focus on affordability. And we're pleased that the staff has recommended approval for our project. But we're equally pleased to have the conditional <laughs> support of NOAA and stand up pending the successful execution of a community benefits agreement that is currently underway. We also have the full support of Freeman Webb, the Salvation Army, PATH, and Affordable Housing Resources, who are all longtime supporters of housing and affordable housing here in Nashville. So again, I want to thank all the parties I previously mentioned. We look forward to fulfilling the plan as presented here today and bringing these community benefits that we have developed with the neighborhood to fruition. Uh, we hope that the commission will approve us to help bring a portion of the planning department's Dickerson South Corridor study to, fr to fruition through this specific plan. I thank you all for your time. Thank you, and we'll save two minutes uh, for rebuttal. So now we're on to anyone wishing to speak in support of the project. Uh, Come on, come on up, and everybody will get two minutes. And then, if you would, just state your name and address for the record. And we appreciate y'all coming down. Welcome. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Ingrid Campbell, and I live at 313 Grace. Ma'am, if you could just, yeah, get a little okay. closer. There we go. Thank okay. you. My name is Ingrid Campbell, and I live at 313 Grace. I'm representing, I'm representing the McFerrin Park Neighborhood Association. I am the president. Today, I'm speaking on behalf of the community in support of SP 083-001. Now, I'm going to give you a little history of McFerrin Park community. McFerrin Park is nestled between the iron grid of locomotive Ellington Parkway and the asphalt trails of what I refer to as the metal bison, which is I-65. A once overlooked and discarded neighborhood that fought for crumbs survived the image of being sometimes less than viable. A change has come. And we are now a destination point. The community is walkable and visible of downtown. River Chase, and East Bank. Today, McFerrin Park hosts perching red hawks, the occasional free-range chicken, and then strolling coyote every once in a while going down Meridian Street. We have residents who are now safe enough or feel secure enough to go out and sweep their, their streets or the sidewalk. That is awesome. There's a sense of peace and security that's returning. Well, here's the stats of McFerrin Park community. The community comprises of 243 acres. The community di di demographics is diverse. There's 2,500 residents with an average household income about $31,000 annually. However, we are in the midst of an upward swift shift as a steady influx of new people are coming to Davidson County. So Metro, of course, is seeing the swell spread across the county. And it's a challenge. The average purchase price for McFerrin Park homes in 2019 was $294,000. 2020, the average price was $346,000. As of December of last year, it was $493,000. This is astounding. Imagine the impact this has on renters and the people who currently own the home who are being bombarded by phone calls to sell. So. Now we get to Korea, the opportunity, the land. In May of 2021, Korea was introduced as the new pr prospective buyer of River Chase. 
a 212 unit income, low, low income housing complex. And about half of them were section eight within McFerrin Park neighborhood. CREA proposed a complete redevelopment of the apartment complex. Initially, the new site design consists about 1,150 units, of which 150 were allocated to affordable housing. The current, uh, the current closed streets that we have, which is North 2nd and Barry Street, will be open for traffic. And there was a height increase in that area of three stories to, well, actually two stories to eight to 10 stories. This was part of the proposal. The community listened and replied with concerns. Affordable housing, eight to 10 story structure, increased density, traffic volume, parking. So where are we now? Awesome. Korea listened to us. For the most part, we got everything we wanted, but that's not how relationships work, the little give and take. We got the affordable housing. Great, it went from 212 to 220 units. Take note, Nashville. We got community investment from a developer in our community. We're not just a piece of land, we are people. Three, we got a developer who actually hired a representative to be a liaison with our community. Why? Communication. You don't have communication, you don't have a relationship. You don't have a relationship, there's no transparency. And four, there is a robust plan in place for traffic calming, which will be a, a concern when you're talking about 1,150 units times two people per unit. So did we get everything? No. And you will hear those challenges from my fellow Fair and Park people. And I thank you. Thank you, ma'am. We appreciate it. And personally, I very much appreciate you asking ahead of time for the five minutes, which many people do not do. So thank you for that. It means a lot. All right. Who's next in support? Come on up. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jackie Sims, and I am the executive, executive director of PATH. Pull this down. Um, People's Alliance Around Transit, Affordable Housing, and Employment. Um, more important than my position is the fact that I, too, am housing insecure. And at this point, I would like to invite the guest um, that I brought with me. Um, I would like all the persons that came with me from River Chase to please stand. And if you don't want to stand, you can just put your hand up. And then after that, I would like my staff, um, who literally worked their butt off on this project, to stand also. Thank you. For me, it was very important to have um, residents, tenants of River Chase come to this meeting. I have also invited them to come to some of the meetings that we've had with some of the community organizations as well as Korea, Korea. because far too often those voices, those faces are never seen, never heard and I find that a bit disturbing. Um, it's been a growth and a learning experience for all of us, including the tenants. Um, I want to thank Korea and the person of Victor and Stephen who are here for listening um, to the things that I had to say to them. I've been on the ground as an advocate for housing justice for over a decade here in Nashville. They heard me. It didn't require any pressure or harassment or strong arming. Um, we had respectful conversations about the things that I thought were very important for the people that I serve. So they have agreed to all of the things that we asked for. The first thing being time to make um, moves that would be minimally, there's always stress with moving, but I wanted a minimal amount of stress. Um, for our, our tenants. So they were allowed to um, get the fees that they need, uh, the first month's rent um, to be paid. Um, they also have allotted um, expenses to pay for the physical move. 
Um, and because we were able to get some of those things, we thought as an organization that we would help with more of the physical things that we recognized a lot of our tenants need. Beds, tables, chairs, um, sofas, uh, things that we all take for granted um, that I noticed a lot of the tenants didn't have. So I'm grateful that this project um, has turned out as well as it has. I hope it will set a precedent for other projects in Nashville moving forward. Um, I think that the persons that I serve, not just in River Chase, but around the county um, and the surrounding county are, are far too often neglected. So I hope this will be a model moving forward, um, showing how we can do business better um, as a city. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys, here's the deal. We we don't clap or we don't do any of that stuff, whether it's a good clap or a bad clap. So, all right, anyone else? Um, yes, sir. Come on up. State your name and address. We appreciate you coming down. Hey, how y'all doing today? Let me take this off. Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nathaniel Card. I live at 1406 Western Lane, Spring Hill, Tennessee. Today I'm representing Stand Up Nashville in support of 2021 SP-80, I mean 083001. On January the 29th, me and my team canvassed the River Chase Apartments to get some real feedback from the people who still lived in the River Chase Apartments. The information that we obtained was the 68 families still lived on the property, and out of those 68 families, six of those families were currently on Section 8 vouchers. So let's do some quick math real quick. You do 68 families times three, that's three, per, three people per household, that's 204 people that will be displaced. Now I have a question for the Planning Commission. Have you ever looked into a person's eyes who was scared because they didn't know the future of their fam what their family would hold? These families know that they are being displaced and that there is no housing in the city of Nashville for them to move to. Although they own Section 8 vouchers and housing navigators are available, they do not have the help that they, that they need from the city of Nashville for the housing. Korea and, Salvation, Korea and the Salvation Army are doing a good job with the housing navigators, but they're having to move our people of the city of Nashville outside of the county so they can get housing. Next, I would like to paint a picture for you all. This painting is real because I witnessed it. You have a grandmother who is retired, now on fixed income. She's been living in River Chase for 10 years plus. Now she has to move. The issue now is she's only receiving $1,300 a month in SSI. So tell me where was she supposed to live in the city of Nashville making $1,300 a month? Or take the grandfather that's been dependent on Metro Public Transportation to get to and from work for 30 years. With him dealing with the displacement, he'll be put outside the city and he will not be able to work. This puts him in a situation that he might lose his job that he's been at for 30 years. Even more because he's pushed out of his home and a city that he doesn't know anything about. While the city was been playing checkers, they should have been playing chess. This displacement is a serious matter that will neg negatively affect so many lives. So let's just sit back and think about the 30 to 50,000 affordable houses still needed in the city of Nashville and the families that will be displaced. I just hope we can work towards fixing this displacement in Nashville, and I hope the picture, the picture that I painted for you all, I hope you all got it. Thank you again for your time, and I appreciate y'all for having me here today. Thank, hey, you. thank you, sir. Appreciate you coming down very okay. much. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? Come on up. Welcome. Thank you. 
and hello to the commission members, the planning commission members. My name is Sandra Stratton. I live at 325 Gatewood Avenue, Nashville 37207. I'm here today to tell you Stacy Abston's story. She planned to be here today, but she works at a daycare, and today she called to say that they are staff sh short staffed due to COVID. But she gave me permission to share her name and her story, and this is it. I moved to R River Chase in 2020. In 2021, I found out that River Chase had been sold and we would need to move. I have filled out my application. I have a house na housing navigator from the Salvation Army. Her name is Donna Cartwright. My housing navigator found a three bedroom apartment for me and my family, but it's in Madison. That's too far. I work at a daycare in Nashville. I take care of infants. I have to be at work at 8 a.m. And that's after I get my kids off to school. Madison is too far away. My housing navigator is waiting to hear from me when I find an apartment closer to my work and I'm approved. I have a voucher. I don't own anything, owe anything on rent. I'm ready to move. But finding an apartment with enough bedrooms for my family and close to my work has been very hard. I want to thank the Salvation Army for the help they have given me finding a place to live. Thank you also to CREA for providing funds to assist with the move. Thank you to the East Bank Work Group for working with us, and thank you Planning Commission members. We met many at people at River Chase with similar stories. Their rent is current, they have a voucher, they work here in Nashville, and they can't find housing. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Sorry I jumped the gun a while ago. Oh, it's perfectly fine. <laughs> I did too. Yeah, I felt good about that. <laughs> um, good afternoon, commissioners, and thank you for this time. My name is Martha Carroll, and I live at 325 Gatewood Avenue, 37207. And today I speak on behalf of NOAA in support of the Meridian Street development. Since the winter of 2019, when I first contacted Matt Mathias, a developer from Austin, Texas, who purchased River Chase, NOAA has been focused on displacement, an ongoing crisis we have struggled to address for years. In the summer of 2019, NOAA, together with McFerrin Park Neighborhood Association, Open Table, Workers' Dignity, PATH, and Council Member Sean Parker met with Mr. Mathias and came to an agreement that 150 units at the new complex would be affordable. Eventually, the property was sold to Cypress Real Estate Advisors, also from Austin. Mr. Mathias assured us his commitment would be honored by CREA. CREA honored that agreement and continued to meet with us and others. In May of 2021, the East Bank Work Group was formed to get involved in East Bank development decisions. Members include Stand Up Nashville, Equity Alliance, Leuna, Local SEIU, NOAA, McFerrin Park Neighborhood Association, and Trinity Community Commons. We have canvassed River Chase three times, held several meetings for residents where we listened to their stories, concerns, and needs. And, in, and assisted them in creating a list of demands during this transitional time. Our thanks to my council member, Sean Parker, Matt Mathias, and CREA for working with our community to make this current agreement possible. CREA increased the number of affordable units from 150 to 220 and will ensure affordability is permanent. They have provided up to $2,200 in financial assistance for moving and hired housing navigators to work with residents. Families can remain at River Chase till the school year ends. Thank you, CREA. You have done far more than any other developers to help displaced residents make difficult transitions. Pending the completion of a community benefits agreement currently in the works, we endorse this project. But River Chase is one small part of a much bigger picture. We are not prepared for what's coming. We have a hodgepodge of offices without a clear chain of command. We hear, not my department, or we don't have that authority. We suggest a way forward. For starters, we need your strong leadership, planning commissioners. You make recommendations to the mayor's office, Metro Council, and other government entities. 
We need investment from our city that equals the magnitude of this crisis. We need an adequately staffed Department of Housing to be able to tackle our challenges. We need dedicated revenue funding streams for the Barnes Fund. We need your voices to say that public lands be used to create mixed-use housing, including housing for our very low-income families, which is our greatest need. We suggest an equity lens to ensure a fair and equitable process. The East Bank Work Group is developing an equity lens and would welcome the opportunity to collaborate with your planning department. Our nation has chosen to make many injustices we once thought were acceptable, such as slavery and child labor, against the law. Can we be among those who name a lack of shelter for the inhumane, unjust system that it is? What if we accept that shelter is a human right? What if, we, what if the people who teach in our schools wait on us in restaurants, pick up our garbage, and care for us in hospitals, daycare facilities, and nursing homes could afford to live in the city where they work? What if the almost 4,000 homeless school children here in Davidson County had a home in which to live? We want this discussion to move beyond costs of construction and number of units. Let's all recognize the importance of community the value of belonging, the need for safety. Let's acknowledge the value of one child, of 4,000 children, of all children growing up in a home they can trust will be there for them today, tomorrow, and all through their childhood. We call on you, commissioners, to take the lead. We will do all we can to support you. Can we do it? How can we not do it? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Come on up. Welcome. Thank you. Major Ethan Frizzell with the Salvation Army. I recognize you give more time as if asked for. My normal sermons take 15 minutes. <laughs> well, but I won't do that today. <laughs> Let me say uh, and share our support of this project. The Salvation Army has been in the neighborhood since 1940. Uh, we own five acres, as you may know, between Berry Street and Grace Street. Uh, we also own three acres on the corner of Gray Street and Joseph Street, so this is our neighborhood. One thing that uh, Nashville can recognize is that we no longer have a not-in-my-backyard issue when it comes to homeless sheltering, uh, because at our Center of Hope, we have up to 85 people every night that are living with us, and we are their home. When CREA purchased the property, I made my annual call to a Texas developer because I've been trying to negotiate for this property for five years. Usually I would get shut down very quickly. Uh, and so I called with an argument and I was surprised to find none. Instead, I found Victor on the other side saying, Major, what do we need to make this happen? Let me share with you that term again, legacy resident. The idea that if someone is currently paying their rent and has been a good resident of River, River Chase, they get priority access back into the neighborhood. Something has to be done with the neighborhood because it's deteriorated. The life cycle is done of those buildings. But having that access back should be a standard that is, that is used to encourage others. The second part is, is the issue of social displacement. It is a sad truth. Development of any property displaces people. But CREA stepped up with a program called Compassionate Change that says we will help people with funds to move. And they've given the discretion to the Salvation Army and PATH to use those funds. And not once have they suggested we spend less. They only call me when they say you need to spend more to make sure people get to where they need to go that's comfortable for them. So I, I hope that these type of standards may become part of the common language as we see up and down Dickerson Pike owners that can't be found and people who are being displaced in a month instead of being given a year. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? Come on up. Welcome. Hey, y'all. My name is David Rutledge. I live at 508 North 2nd Street, 37207, which, if you're looking at the map, is basically right at the joint of the elbow right there, uh, nestled right up against River Chase. Uh, I'm also active in the McFerrin Park Neighborhood Association, 
and am involved in uh, this process through my uh, affiliation with the East Bank Work Group and my role as a representative of the Laborers International Union of North America, Local 386. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, uh, while well, I'm speaking provisionally in favor of this redevelopment, uh, I'd like to thank Victor and Cree and the rest of his team for their willingness to communicate with our, uh, with our efforts and what appears to be a good faith engagement uh, with us in trying to make this project something that's good for everybody. I will say, however, that we do have continuing concerns, uh, particularly around the environmental impact of this redevelopment. Uh, given the age of these buildings uh, and the condition of some of them, it stands to reason that there's a, stands to reason that there is a substantial amount of mold, lead, asbestos uh, on the site, and we don't think that there's any such thing as too little caution in making sure that those things are are, are addressed safely for the residents, mm -hmm. the neighborhoods, and or the neighbors and the workers involved in the demolition process. Uh, fortunately, uh, we have been approached by CREA to negotiate a community benefit agreement, and that's one of the things that we look forward to addressing, but we did want to put it on the record that that is one of our major concerns involving the redevelopment. So with that, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? We'll make sure we get to everybody. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? All right. Seeing no one else, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Welcome. Come on up. Hey, um, I'm Mike Yang. I'm at 609 North 2nd Street, so about a block away from this. Um, my main concern with this is I, I really do commend how well Korea has done with their presentation and how they've worked with the community. They've uh, reached out to us several times. Um, and really, my main concern is kind of with the Dickerson South Corridor study, which I know has done in the past, um, they were following it, but this eight to 10, well, 10 story punctuation of height just seems quite dramatic when it's less than 200 feet from, you know, a 10 foot single, 15 foot single story home. Uh, it's like 10 times the height of it. If you look at it, it it'd be literally 150 feet away from that. Um, and so it's mostly through that and then um, I think if you look at the Dickerson South Corridor study as a whole, you'll see that everything on the eastern side of Dickerson Pike is intended to be neighborly friendly. So it has a maximum of four stories along Dickerson Pike and then three stories into the neighborhood, whereas here you have six and 12, or six and 10 stories up. Uh, I think six stories is consistent with what we're seeing in other similar neighborhoods on Jefferson Street, on Main Street, um, in East Nashville, and in Germantown. And that 10 stories here just seems really, really excessive. And um, if they went down to six stories, would probably be, be more in line with what we're seeing in other neighborhoods um, that are in similar situations in an urban environment. Also want to note that this is kind of outside of the inner loop, directly outside of the inner loop of downtown, whereas Jefferson Street and Germantown and Monroe and stuff like that are technically within the inner loop of downtown. So just kind of concerned about the 10 stories of height and think that if they could scale that down a little bit, that would be way better for the neighborhood and would be better for everybody that lives there. Thank you. Anyone else? Come on up. <clears throat> Welcome. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Bill Holbrook. I live at 209 Trutland Avenue. Uh, in February of uh, 2020, when I addressed this uh, similar committee when they were approving the uh, Jefferson or uh, Dickerson Road uh, uh, corridor study, uh, I had voiced my opposition to the eight and 10 stories that were planned uh, in this. Uh, at that point in time, uh, this committee uh, kind of kicked it back and said, hey, let's approve uh, the Jefferson or the uh, Dickerson Road study, but let's focus on this specific area. Uh, when they focused on this specific area, a, an agreement was reached with the previous owners, uh, Matt Mathias, I believe his name was, uh, just to have a, uh, a six-story footprint uh, through, throughout this area. Uh, I echo uh, my neighbor Mike's concerns about eight and ten stories less than 100 feet away from two-story houses. Uh, Korea has been like super great. Uh, the neighborhood is like totally behind redevelopment of this site. We know that they are doing good things for the neighborhood and for the displaced residents. However, we would like a more reasonable uh, and thought out approach to redevelopment in our neighborhood. And we feel that eight to 10 stories is a bit egregious. 
thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wish to speak in opposition? All right. Seeing none, we're on rebuttal. Two minutes. No rebuttal? You guys are good? Okay. No rebuttal. The applicant doesn't want to use the two minutes for rebuttal. Councilman, you ready? Come on up. Welcome. Um, thank you, Commissioners. Um, so this is this is a, a massive project for this neighborhood, um, and I think that my involvement with uh, um, again, I'm, I'm Councilmember Parker. I need to introduce myself for the record. Uh, represent this area. Um, you know, my involvement with the River Chase community really began in um, I think it was 2018 um, through then McFerrin Park neighborhood leadership looking into the. Um, status of their um, light tech credits and you know what was happening they had they had applied to I think in 2017 they had applied to opt out of income and rent restrictions for this property um, so that was sort of when it came onto my radar I know path was working there in 2018 as well um, I think I ended up knocking doors down there in 2019 when I was running um, and, and starting to build relationships with some of the folks um, it's it's um, you know, it is, as has been said, an aging, um, older property. I think probably the last few owners of it, um, I, I would characterize their stewardship of the property as, as disinvestment. So not only do you have an aging property, you have um, sort of a lack of maintenance and whatnot. Um, and the feasibility of, you know, someone coming in and um, really making this place a great livable community um, is not, it's just not feasible um, at this point. So uh, we've been through a few rounds. Uh, there was, a, as has been mentioned, another group out of Austin, Texas that had initially proposed a redevelopment plan with much less specificity, um, much less commitment to the existing residents and supporting them, much less infrastructure um, and, and community benefits generally. Um, that ultimately didn't move forward, um, so we were pleased when CREA uh, was so willing to engage with the community. And um, I also just, just really want to highlight that, that the sort of work product that you're seeing, I think as, as Victor mentioned, I counted at least 20 meetings about this property over the last five years or so. Um, if I tried to add up the dozens of people that were at each of those meetings, I, I was actually trying to estimate that earlier, and I came up with you know roughly 12 or 1,300 hours of, of community members' um, time poured into to, to getting where we are today. So this really um, what you're what you're seeing proposed here, and 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 all of Korea's engagement and commitment is is a very much a a, a group effort, um, and. I, I would love to thank some of the groups. I'm terrified of, of missing anyone um, because it was so important. But uh, the McFerrin Park Neighborhood Association was super critical in you know being the forum where a lot of these meetings and engagement happened. Um, and, and they're just a phenomenal neighborhood group. Um, PATH and Stand Up have done a tremendous job of, of helping to engage with residents to make sure that they were informed and involved with the process. Um, you know, some meetings were. Um, contentious, you know, uh, not, not necessarily contentious, uh, tense, um, but I thought it was better to err on the side of having people understand what was being proposed than it was to, um, you know, we, we asked the, uh, we asked CREA to put signs up throughout the property in order to inform people about meetings that were happening regarding their homes, um, which I think is something that I'd, I'd love to see, um, uh, sort of as a, as a precedent throughout Nashville when we're talking about redeveloping places where a considerable number of people live. Um, uh, NOAA and their advocacy um, consistently through this process has been a, a huge benefit. Um, the, uh, the sort of newly formed East Bank work group has been a really helpful venue for sort of talking through some of the specifics of projects like this. And um, again, I just want to emphasize that this was very, very much a, a group effort, um, and and I'm, I'm I'm pleased with where we are right now. And um, I would ask this uh, commission to support this plan uh, as it's been presented. Thank you, Councilman. Thank Appreciate you. you coming today. Seeing no one else switching to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. And Commissioner Tibbs, you want to go first? Um. 
I don't have a whole lot to say technically. I do like the, the, the two first things. I do like the way the Jefferson Street thing is being, the Jefferson Street, I'm Jefferson Street, I'm sorry, Dickerson Street realignment. Uh, I think that's a, that, that's a, a I, I would just say a clever thing that's come out of it. I think it's going to be really good for it. Um, the entire development, I think, has worked really well. I'm okay with the extra stories, um, which is because of the density of it all. I bet you that helps kind of make it all work well. Um, but mostly, I can't go without saying, I, I, this is the type of teamwork and interaction with the community and with the different groups that really gets to be what a successful solution really looks like. So, uh, so many times we have opposition, and a lot of times it's just because that communication doesn't really happen. And I think that type of teamwork that the developer, the designer, the, you know, all the different community groups that had an input into it is why it's such a successful solution. And, you know, I, I think the process would have been probably very enjoyable to be part of something like this. So, um, you know, hats off to, you know, everything you guys have done. I think this is the type of your, your product shows the authorship and ownership of everyone. So um, I'm, I'm very much in support of this and staff recommendation. Commissioner Blackshear. Um, I'd like to echo everything my fellow commissioners said. Uh, I'm really blown away by everything. I mean, it's really impressive. We've seen more recently, not certainly not every developer, but more recently more committed developers, which is really impressive. But this by far is the most impressive case that I've seen. Um, and not only the developer, but just strong advocates for the city and for the city residents with Stand Up Nashville, and Path and Noah, we've seen you a lot of times before. Um, and then obviously the efforts of the residents. I mean, really, it's something that's really impressive. And as a native Nashvilleian, it honestly makes me very sad sometimes to drive through areas of the city and see how much not only things have changed from like buildings, but just people you knew that used to live there that could no longer live there. Um, so this is something that I really just love to see. And the, the fact that the developer has been so committed to the city and this is really impressive. Um, the only question I had, one of the um, speakers spoke of the environmental hazards. And I know that's probably not within the confines of planning, but I did have questions about, I guess, how that works and what Metro's involvement would be with that. Sure. So um, any demolition of buildings would require a demolition permit to go through codes, and I believe that codes would be involved in any sort of review of materials that may be hazardous in that way. There are standards for how you have to tear down buildings that are of certain ages. Okay, and I, I know this is implicit in what you said, just to make sure that I'm understanding. So when they make that review, obviously the, the presence of any type of harmful materials would be included in that analysis and built into how the demolition can happen safely. I believe that's correct. I'm not 100% certain of the internal Workings, but I know that there are standards for um, removal of buildings of a certain age, and codes would be involved in that. Okay. Well, um, I appreciate everyone coming down. I appreciate the councilman for pulling this off. Usually we don't like when people pull things off. They're going to um, cause an hour, two hour long um, public hearing, but this is fantastic, and I'm glad you did it, and I'm glad to have heard from everyone who spoke today. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank for the community and everybody working together for this uh, plan. And especially thank you for the Councilman uh, Parker. It's a great work. It is so heartwarming to see a majority of the idea was embraced by community. So in this plan, uh, first uh, I found on the tentative or consent agenda item, uh, one thing I really wanted to ask was displacement of the community. Uh, and I understand, you know, council member was working with the community. And today I hear uh, actually from NOAA and all other organization, uh, you know, to uh, displacement, to prevent displacement is a number one goal. And it's so heartwarming to see because oftentimes, 
you know, community kind of uh, scramble after we uh, approve and then uh, community actual resident engagement happens. And so, you know, unintentionally, uh, lots of people uh, have such a hard time and emotional toll and so forth. And this plan, you know, putting that ahead of the uh, project, uh, that's very commendable. One thing I would like to, you know, for us to going forward is for us to have that kind of a tool. Because as of right now, as a commissioner, as a planner, we do not have that kind of pool, a tool. And, you know, I think we cannot even legally uh, condition uh, those displacement, you know, in the part of the plan. So we would like to, going forward, uh, you know, explore uh, that kind of opportunity. So I think that's the right thing to do because, you know, we are, we desperately need affordable housing, but just to have affordable housing displacing existing affordable uh, house and, you know, inconvenient uh, many, many residents kind of defeat the purpose. So I would like to uh, explore that. But other than that, I think plan is really well thought out. I would love to see uh, option two with a really robust uh, connection plan. And um, another one, uh, I know there was uh, always height because, you know, height where two story, you know, traditional home and then uh, seeing a 10 story will be uh, kind of changed. But I think, you know, since this is a conceptual plan, I think uh, during the final plan, maybe better transition, pushing the 10 story towards the uh, interstate and then gradually uh, going lower height uh, to the transition to existing neighborhood. I, the way I read was that's the intention. So hopefully, you know, that uh, really uh, make much, much better transition, even though we, I'm really excited and reading, you know, towards our, our staff recommendation. So hopefully we uh, approve this plan. And, but with community and development team, with Council Member Parker, uh, keep working and then better transition for the final plan. Uh, that would be my hope. But I am very, very excited. I'm really thankful for this robust project. Thank you, Commissioner. Councilman? Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to everyone that came out and spoke today. I, I agree with Commissioner Blackshear. It's, uh, it's been a really great discussion, uh, even though I think the staff recommendation is approval. It sounds like most people are in approval. This has been a really great discussion, and uh, I appreciate hearing from the, the applicant and the work that the applicant has done. We don't always have folks who buy properties and do that much work with the community, um, particularly sometimes when they don't have any obligation to work with existing residents and we can't necessarily require it either. Um, at the council level, the council member doesn't have to sponsor your rezoning though, so sometimes we can do that, but that's kind of a blunt tool and sometimes it's the only one that the council has. But appreciate council member Parker's work on this one. I know he's worked uh, for some other recent developments along Dickerson Pike to really engage the neighbors and I, and I think this, uh, this is a beneficiary of that experience of kind of getting a little bit more ahead of in front of it and having more time to, to work with a property owner on, on the application. Um, I, I think this is really great, you know, and with um, Envision Casey, which I've worked on a lot, we've uh, been very fortunate uh, in some ways that we've been able to build new housing without displacement, and that's because there's open space uh, in places in Casey that allows us to build some new stuff. It, we have to move people sometimes once or twice uh, to get them into that new housing, but we've been able to take advantage of some of that open space in Casey to build new housing without displacement. We've lost some trees, um, but it's uh, usually for a, a good purpose, and we've worked around some of the really significant trees there. This site, uh, like, like some of the other larger sites where housing is being proposed, it, I'm sure that was explored, but it may not be possible to do here. So um, I appreciate the commitment to letting folks uh, have a, who are displaced have a priority to come back, but for sure this is something we struggle with as council members and as a city is that uh, when you do find someone 
housing that they can afford, uh, a lot of times it's far from their school or their workplace or transportation, and we don't always have good solutions for this, but I, it sounds like the, the best has been made of the situation that could be, and, and it sounds like everyone will stay committed to working through that to find any opportunities, so I think that's really good. Um, you know, for this, this community in um, McFerrin Park, you know, I've been uh, involved as a neighborhood uh, volunteer and neighborhood leader for 15 years in East Nashville. And it really is quite a, a drastic change, I think, uh, for McFerrin Park. Um, the, uh, actually, you know, we used to have, uh, Billy Fields used to have the East Caucus where all the East Nashville neighborhood leaders would get together once a month and talk about what issues we had and we talked to the city. And that was always a great venue just to hear about, you know, what different expectations were and what different folks were dealing with. But I know I always enjoyed getting to work with uh, community members, uh, uh, community leaders in McFerrin and Cleveland Park, Maxwell, Greenwood, some of those neighbors. Uh, and we always um, uh, tried, to, tried to help each other out when we could while respecting our, our differences because um, different, sometimes adjacent neighborhoods can have very different attitudes or opinions on, on the same topic. So. Uh, but I know, uh, you know, several years ago, some of the speakers that spoke today, whom I respect so much, um, you know, we uh, had an opportunity for folks on the, kind of the District 6 side to join in with some of the neighbors over there, working as well with the, the East Precinct. There was a lot of community concern about uh, crime and just safety uh, for themselves and their families on, on North 2nd Street. Um, and the community worked with the East Precinct very closely, the McFerrin Park Neighborhood Association, Cleveland Park Neighborhood Association, Ray O'Hare Church was there. I think Salvation Army was involved. Um, but it, it, it is such a, uh, a dramatic change uh, in McFerrin Park, whereas in the Five Points area, that revitalization effort started in the 70s. So, you know, 45 years have gone into getting it to where it is today, right? I mean, I don't think that anyone who started doing historic preservation in Edgefield in the 70s would have ever thought that you would have a house that sold for more than $200,000, much less a million. But it has been a really, like a steady, a much more steady pro, you know, progression, if you want to use that word, to get to that point. Whereas I think in the McFerrin Park community in particular, I mean, this has been a really overnight change. I mean, it's happened in just a few years when you get to the, that price appreciation that uh, Ingrid spoke about. So I think that is a, a really drastic change, and uh, it's heartening to me that, that this developer is willing to work with the community as much as they can uh, to smooth out that transition a little bit and not simply have a development that comes in and, and reinforces that so quickly, and at least is willing to work with people to, to uh, bring them back in to housing units so they can rejoin their neighborhood when those units are built. Uh, one of the things I did want to ask about a little bit with the re realignment plan, uh, I think just for, for staff maybe, or maybe for the applicant, but I think the 10-story the part that was mentioned was only kind of at that point of Meridian and Dickerson. Is that correct, that punctuation point? It is. That's right. Um, okay. And, it, and the, south, the Dickerson South plan is very specific in that it's only at that corner. And right. that's where they've gone up to 10. Okay, thank, thank you for that clarification. I understand why neighbors would be concerned about having a 10-story building kind of looming over them. The kind of the way that I think about it is like when it's, if it's, a, if it's like a gateway building, which this sort of seems to be, I think that helps to have some visibility for it, but also have it not overpower the neighborhoods quite as much as if it were immediately adjacent to the neighbors. It seems like it's a pretty good step down. When you come into Ed, the Edgefield community, which is also a historic neighborhood, you know, we've got the... Edgefield Manor senior, senior Tower, I think that's nine stories maybe. It's in the midst of a campus, but sometimes you can have a building that is a very visible building, but that also is placed into a campus and doesn't overpower the neighborhood. And I feel like the step-down proposal that's been uh, put in place is, is appropriate, where it, it tapers it down to different levels. One other thing I wanted to ask about as well, because like I said, I know years ago the Dickerson Road Merchants Association and MDHA and other organizations worked very hard to find something to do that's positive with the island that exists there today and in creating the, the buffalo uh, statues and parks. So I know the Dickerson Road Merchants Association worked very hard on that. And with the option two with a realignment, has there been discussion about how that would, how that would work with the, with the buffalo? Uh, statues that are in place. 
So the realignment plan is, is very preliminary at this point because we will have to have detailed conversations with uh, NDOT and TDOT involved. Um, I think either plan or the realignment plan does still leave some open space, sort of a, di a bit of a different configuration, but there is open space after the realignment. And so there's opportunities, of course, to relocate uh, those features in that space. Um, that would be part of sort of that overall conversation with NDOT and TDOT about what that final alignment looks like. Okay, great. That, like I said, I just, I know uh, Charlie Bob's and a lot of those business owners and community groups, and I'm, I'm sure the neighborhood groups too, work, work really hard on that to kind of do something nice with the space and recognize a, a historical feature of uh, prehistoric Nashville um, so that It'd be great to include that in future discussions and in addition to the transit mobility piece. Um, but all, all this sounds really good. One of the things I do wanna just give a, a little bit of a plug to is this is outside of, or just barely outside of, but very adjacent to the East Bank planning study. We have a lot of good work that's going on there. Many of the, of the same neighborhood groups are part of that and community groups. And just wanna encourage everyone to, um, Sort of, we have this great community advisor group that includes uh, Stand Up Nashville, McFerrin Park, Cleveland Park, some of the other organizations, and just encourage everyone to keep working together to share resources uh, and ideas. I know uh, in terms of finding materials uh, and furniture for for folks that need it, um, Nashville First Church of the Nazarene does a lot of community service. They're also part of our East Bank Planning Study Community Advisory Group. They have a 510 foundation, they call it, which. They, that's one of the things that they kind of specialize in, so uh, is f uh, donating furniture to people that might need it. So I uh, just uh, want to encourage folks to keep working and building those relationships within our East Bank planning study, uh, not just within the East Bank specifically, but also these adjacencies, to really uh, just continue the benefit of those relationships that we're building uh, inside and outside of the East Bank planning study. But all this sounds really good, and I'm, I really do appreciate all the work that's been done in the discussion we had today. And, uh, I support the staff recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. And Commissioner Henley is recusing himself, so Commissioner Sims, is that, that, is that correct? It's just stated on the record. Commissioner Henley, are you recused? Thank you. Uh, first Sims. of all, I just want to thank everybody. Um, as you heard earlier, this is my last meeting, and this could not have been a better gift to me because in the five years I've been here, I've gotten to see our city grow so fast, and so many I'm sure well-intentioned developers come, but do harm and not realize what's actually happening. So for NOAA and for the Salvation Army, for the not, those of you who are not-for-profit organizations, bringing this continually to the awareness of our conscience as a city is just so extremely important. So thank you. Keep doing it. I know, though, after the five years, if I look back and think, what have I learned over the last five years, I would think how important it is to have a council member, strong enough, council leader, strong enough to stand up and really do what the people want. It's hard. And we've had a lot of areas in our town that um, the people couldn't come together. And as a matter of fact, one of the strongest tools that scares the heck out of me right now is a city leader, whether I'm in the seat or not, is um, is co-optation where people are being bought off to for their support with very little intention or promise that they can keep that word. So the community benefits uh, uh, is a is a beginning tool. We don't have much to hold on to there. So continuing to strengthen that, I really encourage you to do that. I also really believe that what you're showing us tonight is one really good model, but we also know that the replication of models do not does not happen without good data, and I've preached this for the last five years. So somewhere really getting what really happened, here's what we intended, what really happened, so that we can learn along the way. There's a This is a university town. There's a lot of hungry PhD students that would be ha happy to help. That's one of the areas that I will miss pushing on up here. So I really encourage you to capture what's happening. Don't be afraid to look at the real picture and do self-correction as you go. And again, I thank you. You could not have given me a better going away gift. Ms. Haynes. 
So sometimes things happen for a reason. I was supposed to stay at work this afternoon, um, and unfortunately I came. I've been on this body 11 years. This may be after the Nashville next meeting, the second most proud I've been to serve in this role. Um, this is incredible. I also learned how to keep Ethan Frizzell to talking for two minutes. <laughs> That's a trick. To follow up on Dr. Sims, um, Councilman Parker, thank you for pulling this off consent. I think we need to pause as a city. This is an opportunity to really dig deep to take people I respect immensely, and that's Hastings and Hawkins and KCI and Stand Up and NOAA, and really do a postmortem. Why was this successful? And to do a case study and to learn from this. Um, as I've said many times up here, the real estate industry enjoys a really tough reputation right above used car salesmen and right beneath attorneys. <laughs> This gives me hope for our city. We need to learn from this. We need to pause and ask ourselves, why has this worked here? If we don't take the time to do a postmortem, Councilman, we're going we're to lose from this process. So I encourage you to take the leadership. you got 39 other council people. We can learn from this as a city and do this over and over again and become a better place. With that, I'd love to make a motion to approve item 13A. That's a, so, commissioners, we're going to thank you, Commissioner Haynes. We're going to vote on these separately, uh, and so that's a proper motion. Is there a second? Second. Any other discussion? And that motion would be to approve item 13A, correct? Correct. Commissioner? All right. That's a proper motion. Second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and 13A is adopted and approved. So before passing or uh, proposing 13B, I do want to take the time to credit staff as well for the Dickerson Road study card, or without that, this doesn't happen. And sometimes I know y'all get tired of hearing the commission ask for y'all to go study something, but in this case, that worked as well. So thank you very much. And with that, I'll propose we uh, pass 13B. Chair, may I just say thank you to um, Commissioner for acknowledging the staff. We worked incredibly hard on this. I will say that I, when I reached out to this developer and asked for patience, we took many more months than is typical um, because we wanted to make sure that all of the mobility and open space and standards were done properly. And this is a really tough site. And I think they did exceptionally well. But thank you for the acknowledgement. And we're, we're grateful for the outcome here. I'm really, really proud of everybody's effort. Thank you, Commissioner, for saying that. Uh, I think part of the success is obviously the community, the public. But uh, being a former council member, I think a lot of times if you do the work on the front end, which I appreciate Councilman Parker for doing, and communicating to the community, and keeping those lines of communication open. And I know we're blessed to have the council member. So I appreciate that. I want to say thank you. And to, the, of course, the community. So, all right, Commissioner, so we got a motion on. Approval of 13B. So that's a proper motion, the approval of 13B. Is there a second? Second, any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. 13B is approved. Thank you, everyone, for coming down. All right. So while we kind of let everybody, I know most people were here for uh, 13A and B, we, we, we have two more items, and I think we should continue to, to forge through. Is that okay, commissioners? All right. We'll just, we'll let... Everybody, um, just give everybody a minute. And if everybody could swiftly move, uh, exit, we really appreciate it because we still have more items for to consider. Thank you.
All right. We are now on to item 14. All right. I'm Dustin Shane, staff planner. Item 14 is 2021 SP 092001, Dodson Chapel Road SP. So this is a request to permit 200 multifamily units on uh, the northwestern side of Dodson Chapel Road. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. The current zoning on the site on the northern half is RS-15. On the southern half is an SP that was for uh, daycare for the church that existed there until the tornado of 2020. The policy on the site, um, conservation is along the western edge. There's a stream there. Um, and then the rest is T3 suburban neighborhood evolving. Here's a layout of the site. Plan right is, the, is, is north. That northern half there, you see there's three buildings. They're three stories each, uh, stacked flat apartment type buildings with parking in the center. As you move left to the south, there's three rows of townhomes with parking to the side and rear. And then in the top left is the stream with stream buffer. The architectural elevations on the top half of the screen, that's the three story stacked flat buildings, pretty typical garden style apartment. On the bottom of the screen is the two-story townhome design. So this is a multifamily development. As I said, 200 units, about 17 units an acre, 160 of those being stacked flats, 40 of those being townhomes. Um, height and massing on the northern half, as I said, getting closer to Old Hickory Boulevard, you've got three stories, more intense. Moving south, you've got the townhomes. Those are across the street from some single-family homes, so less intense, less of a of a change. Transportation wise, they're going to put in a turn lane across um, the length of the site all the way up to Old Hickory Boulevard, going to be improving Dodson Chapel Court, which is that road that bisects the site, and they're going to be installing sidewalks and dedicating right of way in line with the MCSP. So our analysis is that this furthers several goals of the T3NE policy on site. Um, it's more dense and varied than classic suburbs as the policy calls for, but um, not taller than three stories, and actually, too, it's a lower finished floor elevation on that on that side of the street, so the effect will be even less visually. Uh, parking is to the side and rear to reduce that impact and encourage pedestrian activity. Um, developers worked several times to modify the plans to get something that works for everybody and address concerns, so we feel pretty good about this design. Um, the CO policy on site, the, the building footprints will be outside of that, which is the stream buffer. Um, we do have a condition in there, though, per stormwater that all these entitlements uh, of this approval would be conditional on a flood study that needs to be completed before the final SP. So staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove with all conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. We'll open this item for public hearing. Is the applicant in the room? Come on up. You have 10 minutes, and you can save two of the 10 minutes for rebuttal. Please state your name and address. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Mary McGowan. I'm with Kimley Horn, um, located at Tinley Avenue here in Nashville. Um, Dustin kind of stole a lot of my thunder, but I guess I'll reiterate a lot of it, too. Um, it's been a pretty long process with staff, the neighborhood, and the councilmen, um, but we do feel like we've come to a really good um, resolution here. Um, the... Uh, the current use is a uh, daycare on site for the uh, the church, but it was demolished during the tornadoes and has not been rebuilt. Graystar, who is the developer and will be the owner and long-term holder of the property, um, has been working really diligently with the church on the purchase of the property. So during the, um, or after the tornado, the church relocated its daycare facilities elsewhere. And so the church um, is planning to use these proceeds to really fund their daycare operation. Um, our original submittal um, included 375 multifamily units and a small commercial portion um, throughout a lot of the feedback from staff, the neighborhood, the councilmen. Um, the density has been reduced significantly to the 160 multifamily flats, uh, the 40 townhomes, and then the commercial piece was eliminated. Um, as Dustin mentioned, the three-story flats are located on the north parcel, closer to the other um, multifamily units on the other side of Dotson Chapel, and the townhomes are on the southern parcel, which is across the street from the single family. 
homes. Um, throughout the traffic study, um, we also, and these are some improvements that Dustin didn't mention, are in proposing to have some off-site lane adjustments on Old Hickory Boulevard and Dotson Chapel intersection. Um, these improvements are not driven by our development. There's just an existing condition at that intersection that a lot of neighborhoods had concerns over, and so the developer is committed to doing some um, improvements to try and help alleviate those, um, those issues. Um, we are, the two parcels, as you can see, are separated by a public right-of-way that's not really improved. Um, so what we are proposing to do is to um, construct all of Dotson Chapel Court to NDOT standards. Um, we are also adding a center turn lane across the whole length of our property on Dotson Chapel Road. So that's about 1,100 linear feet of a turn lane that's not there today. Um, we are also um, adding 24 feet additional property uh, or 24 feet additional right of way into the property to account for that turn lane, future bike lanes, sidewalks, um, and additional um, landscaping. So, with all that said, we um, accept all of the conditions of approval, and uh, we're here if there's any questions, and we'll save our time for rebuttal. Thank you. So you have two minutes for rebuttal. Uh, anyone? wishing to speak in support of the project. Come on up. Good evening. Uh, my name is Stephen Patton. I live at 4093 Magnolia Farms Drive, so about a mile from the site off Dawson Chapel. I have the unique uh, perspective on this one to be uh, a member of Graystar, so I represent both the professional stakeholder as well as I'm a neighbor stakeholder in this one. Um, I'll speak first of all as, as a member of Graystar. So uh, as Mary mentioned, uh, we really tried our best to uh, um, take neighbor and council member feedback and planning feedback into account here and have significantly changed our plan as a result of that. Um, we had very productive uh, neighborhood and councilman meetings uh, with Councilman Roden, um, which I would kind of characterize the theme of most of that feedback was related to traffic, which Living on the street is a very real concern as you're coming out to Old Hickory. It kind of funnels two lane up to three lanes. Um, as you can see here, and as Mary mentioned, we'll be adding a turn lane um, that kind of spans the entire length of our site, uh, providing relief for folks turning into our site, as well as the bike lane um, and the sidewalk, as well as significantly reducing our density transitioning from Old Hickory Boulevard into the neighborhood um, and kind of dropping in density and amassing as you go back. Um, as far as speaking as a neighbor, you know, you drive by this site currently. Unfortunately, this was uh, kind of a physical casualty of the 2020 tornado. So today it's, it's kind of an unimproved eyesore. Um, I think this site kind of begs for, for some form of residential development. Um, this is a very residential oriented street and I, I would personally if I was living across the street I would kind of see this as a natural buffer to what is the uh, rock quarry plant right behind us which has routine blasting and um, is kind of a visual eyesore so we're also kind of providing a buffer to that as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. Welcome. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, my name is Jimmy Fleming. I work for Vulcan Materials Company. Um, uh, I'm Vice President of Permitting and External Relations, 115 East um, Park place, uh, Brentwood. Um, you know, we operate the rock quarry. Um, I don't personally think it's an eyesore, by the way, but um, it is adjacent to the subject property. And uh, we're not opposed to multifamily on this site. However, we are asking uh, that you vote no on this application. Um, it, alternatively, uh, we have some conditions, uh, restrictions, some additional restrictions on this site that we would like for you to consider that will not only protect our use, uh, the use of the property that we currently have, uh, but also to protect the future tenants or owners' rights uh, that may uh, live um, on this site uh, and that, so that they can enjoy the peaceful enjoyment of their, of their property. 
Uh, the extraction of rock involves blasting and the heavy use uh, of, of, of the use of heavy machinery uh, due to the unusually close proximity of the proposed adjacent development. Vulcan will incur a significant cost in designing specialty blast, um, and it will result in the loss of millions of tons of crushed stone that Vulcan will be unable to mine uh, because of where this is, is placed. We have met with the developer uh, in an attempt to reach an accommodation that would allow um, them to move forward in a way that would accommodate Vulcan's exist existing use. Um, Vulcan was specifically requesting that the developer consider phasing their development so that we would have the time necessary to mine the property most proximate to their development. We even suggested that the corner property on Old Hickory and Dodson Chapel Road could make could be made part of this deal uh, to serve as a commercial property that would help uh, provide commercial services to their development. We're not trying to stop development. We're in the development business, uh, but for these reasons, we'd ask you to vote no tonight, and we, uh, if you would, our letter further explains why. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? <clears throat> a rebuttal? Seeing no one else. Wishing to speak in opposition, it's your rebut you got two minutes for rebuttal. Um, yeah, so I, I guess. Hold on, we'll, we'll get you straight in here. There we go. Do I need to restate my name? <laughs> um, Stephen Patton, 4093 Magnolia Farms Drive. So um, I guess I would just like to say in studying the residential nature of our use here uh, with our, um, with Vulcan being our adjacent neighbor to the north, uh, we did take into account um, seismic considerations for our construction as well as noise considerations. Uh, we kind of factored in our dialogue with Vulcan on the timing of the blast, when that would happen, how we could best collaborate with them to ensure that it's a good residential development along Dotson Chapel while still um, allowing them to continue their you know, operations on their property. Um, and we felt like this, is, this was the best path forward for us. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And I don't, I don't think the councilman here is here. I don't see Councilman Roten here. Okay. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. Commissioner Sand, I mean Commissioner Haynes. I like being called Dr. Sims. That's good. I know. I last night. I know. I'm more learned that way. I know. Um. So I'm troubled. We just heard a case where they collaborated. They met with each other. I know Graystar, we do business with Graystar. This troubles me that y'all aren't meeting with them at their request. Um, so I'm inclined to suggest a deferral. Y'all need to meet, y'all need to work this out. I think this is the right use for the land. Um, it does concern me about the blasting and I would rather see y'all work this out collaboratively before it come back to us. So I'll listen to the my, rest of my fellow commissioners. Commissioner Sims. Well, I liked what Commissioner Sims said, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I agree. This is, this is something that we don't need to arbitrate. You, you guys can work this out, and there is some real issues on both sides here that I think I did go past this property, really look at it. This is, this is dying for some kind of development here, but uh, these are having a quarry is a pretty big deal and how you deal with that with the uh, future tenants is going to be important. So Commissioner Henley um, I have a long time to rest my voice, so I'll talk a little bit longer than um, my fellow commissioners have But I, I am inclined to agree with with both of them um, Very encouraged and honestly just flat-out impressed by what was presented earlier And I think here's an opportunity to just keep that momentum going forward and having those discussions um, but I will speak to some things that I, I, I think are important about this project and, and why I hope it comes back to us and comes back to us quickly. Um, while it is an unfortunate moment, an outcome for what happened in 2020 with the tornado, um, what, we're, what we're looking at is 200 units of homes for people that I honestly would love to get them built as fast as possible because we need them. Um, and it's also zero displacement right, because of the current um, state of the site. So I think that's very important to highlight um, and can honestly turn what was an extreme negative into a positive outcome. Um, I think there's a lot of factors here that make this probably quite challenging from the conservation and other types of things that have to be, have to be done along the site and considerations of what's adjacent to it. Um, but I, I do love what was done 
um, with what is honestly create what I think will be a, a nice thoroughfare through this development in terms of what was put there is um, getting close to having a street that uh, meets all the mobility needs and is very uh, considerate of safety. Um, but I do think also the topography and, and while it is kind of a product of that area, I think it will be uh, pretty interesting to see how that's utilized to minimize that visual impact um, for the community. I know a lot of times when you start to talk about anything above two stories, you have community members, even if they're driving by, not necessarily staring at it um, all the time. That is a, it is a concern, and it seems like that's something that you guys have looked at um, using uh, to your advantage. Um, but again, I'm, I'm going to agree with my the, the comments of our previous uh, commissioners. You know, not having enough information about all of the concerns about seismic activity and, and some of the liability issues and things that I'm sure are there. Um, I would love for what was presented to us to come back with a level of detail and, and some agreement on how um, a strategy has been put in place to, to, to deal with that on both sides. Thank you. Councilman. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, when I moved to town, I had had a roommate who moved out to this very street. And so I hadn't uh, been out visiting this way in a while, but it really brought back a lot of a lot of old memories from those little single-story brick ranch homes across the street where, where my roommate had moved to and used to go hang out uh, over there. Uh, and it, it, it is a shame, certainly, about the, the church that used to be there. And really, this is a good reminder as well that, you know, the 2020 tornado, you know, East Nashville got lots of attention. North Nashville got a lot of community support. I really think the Hermitage community felt kind of left out. Uh, honestly, in terms of they had, they did have a lot of tornado impact in Hermitage, um, and, and Mount Juliet as well. Can't forget them, and even on into Putnam County. But uh, I know the council members here in the Hermitage area. Uh, I know this is Councilmember Roten's district. Councilmember Aaron Evans did a fantastic job, really kind of working with HOAs who had a lot of issues where. They had private utilities and private things that, that, that they didn't have a good way to work through in, in the ways that uh, we do with public utilities in some of the urban core neighborhoods. So I know this, this area really has had a lot of impact, I, I think felt left out uh, from tornado recovery efforts and would definitely love to see something new here. I think all that's true. Um, but having said that, you know, um, I, I agree that it, it'd be good to work a little bit more details out. Um, uh, you know, in the East Nashville area, I have a lot of people buying brand new houses over by uh, Vinny Links Golf Course. It overlooks the river. It also overlooks a gravel yard across the river. And people will buy brand new houses over there, and then they will write to me and say, what are you doing to shut this business down that causes noise at night? So that is a real thing that council members do deal with. Um, and sometimes there's just nothing you can do about it. It seems like in this case, more could be done about it. Um, at, at least to articulate that and maybe phase that in some way where uh, the adjacent business owner isn't, uh, at, at least as a plan for, for how to wrap it up uh, better uh, than what seems to be the case today. So uh, I am inclined to agree that this is a great project. Love adding the sidewalk and especially the bike lane projects there. Dotson Chapel, if, if you go down towards Central Pike, you've got a park uh, with... Uh, there at James K. Lane this weekend when I did my site visits, it was packed full of families using that. It'd be great to have the sidewalks and the bike lanes here to help people access that uh, better. So there's a lot of great things that this project brings, but I think a lot of those details could benefit from a little bit more time and intentional conversation to work it out. And so I'm inclined to support a deferral motion as well. Thank you. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I agree with uh, previous commissioners. I think a basic concept is great. Uh, placement of multi-housing closer to Old Hickory and then transitioning to townhome and street improvement is good, but having active rock quarry as a neighbor is another thing. I think we do need to see more specific condition regarding that, so I'm in support of deferral motion. Commissioner Blackshear. Um, not much more to add. Um, the moving to the nuisance phenomenon is real, and it'd be great if there was more collaboration, and I bet that's going to happen if we do a deferral, so I would be in favor of deferral. Yeah, definitely nothing else to add. I, you know, I, I know the developer from other locations in the country, so there. I know this is going to be easily worked out, but uh, i like to make a motion to defer uh, for two meetings. Yeah, I think that's appropriate. Let's just get on the record. When is it? Is it in the? What's the status in the council? At least this, this 
we can get in the record. There is there is no um, current pan, so, uh, bill working as way through council. There's okay. not a bill. All right, so that's a proper motion to me. Deferral motion is second. Any other discussion? And the intent of that motion is that y'all get together and work this out. Okay. So proper motion is second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. Thank you. All right, so we are on our last item. Item 18. We worked Logan a, a lot last meeting. He only has one <laughs> this meeting. All right. Okay, thank you, Chair. Yes, my name's Logan Elliott, and I'll be presenting item 18 on tonight's agenda. The request is to rezone property from RS10, RM4, and AR2A to SP zoning to permit 182 multifamily units. Staff's recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. The subject site includes three parcels totaling approximately 62 acres. The site is located on the west side of Bluff Road, a local street, and the site is located at the southern boundary of Davidson County. The site is currently vacant and contains heavy veg vegetation, a stream along the northern property boundary, and areas with significant slopes. The surrounding area includes primarily low intensity residential uses with some vacant property and the Nolensville Pike corridor to the north contains a mixture of residential and non-residential uses. The policy for the site is conservation and suburban neighborhood evolving. The suburban neighborhood evolving intends to create and enhance suburban residential neighborhoods with more housing choices, improve pedestrian, bicycle, and vehicular connectivity, and moderate density development patterns with moderate setbacks and spacing between buildings. And the conservation policy intends to preserve environmentally sensitive land features through protection and remediation. And the conservation policy reflects uh, the steep slopes that are on the site, as well as the stream and floodplain and floodway that is also on the northern portion of the site. Uh, so looking at the site plan, the application proposes 182 multifamily units. They're spread throughout the area of the site that does not contain steep slopes as defined by the zoning code. The units are all accessed via private drives and the development relies on a single access point onto Bluff Road. Uh, the private drives have a sidewalk on only one side of the street to better accommodate the topography of the site. Uh, the units are served with the combination of garage parking and driveway parking in front of the units and additional parking is dispersed throughout the site. Um, the application includes a grading plan demonstrating how the site would be graded to realize the proposed plan and to demonstrate how the disturbance would be min uh, minimized and limited to the areas without significant slopes. Uh, the plan also includes a limit of disturbance boundary around the development demonstrating areas that will remain in its natural condition. Uh, staff finds that the application proposes a development pattern that is consistent with the surrounding area and is consistent with the guidance in the suburban neighborhood evolving policy. Uh, the plan proposes an appropriate density considering the existing character of the area. Uh, the proposed building form, including the, the unit type, the setbacks, the spacing of the structures, and the proposed building heights are all supported by the guidance in the suburban neighborhood evolving policy. Uh, the staff finds that the application adequately demonstrates how the significant slopes will be avoided and that the development is focused on the portions of the site without conservation policy. Um, the application also includes off-site improvements, including striping improvements to nearby 
nearby roadways, as well as a guardrail along a portion of this site's frontage uh, between Bluff Road and Mill Creek. And also it's important to note that this proposal represents a decrease in development potential from what is currently permitted on the site with the existing zoning. Uh, thank you, and that completes my presentation. Thank you, Logan. We'll open the sign for public hearing. Is the applicant in the room? Come on up, and you have 10 minutes, and then you can save two of the 10 minutes for rebuttal. State your name and address. Thank you. That's going to fit. Nope. Good evening, uh, commissioners. Um, my name is Chip Howarth with Alfred Benish and Company, uh, 401 Church Street here in Nashville. I um, want to first thank planning staff, as always. They do a lion's share of this work, and uh, we're very thankful for their, them working with us as we go through this process. And, you know, thank uh, Councilmember Swope, too, as we've continued to kind of go through this process, his, his insight into neighborhood and, and um, it was, and the community was just was wonderful. Uh, Logan hit on most of it. You know, the site has unique characteristics which make this SB unique. Um, we feel that we've worked with planning staff and other departments to find a solution that meets the land policy goals. Um, the site's approximately 60 acres. It's split zoned RS10, RM4. Um, it's unique a couple of reasons, mainly, in my opinion, um, the proximity of both Holt Creek and Mill Creek, as well as the topography. Um, we have um, worked very hard to, to avoid encroaching into either, either of those areas. Um, the slope map that Logan showed earlier showed, you know, uh, if you look at the plan up there, uh, the plan uh, east side is, is the 25% slopes that come down to the Bluff Road. And given the floodway buffer of Holt Creek and Mill Creek, there's really only one way to access the property. And we've, we've tried to work our road network in such a way to minimize the impact on those slopes. Um, if you look at GIS and the slope map, the, t the topo looks pretty daunting. Um, through multiple site visits, and we've included some pictures with our application we've shown, it's actually, we believe it's flown topo for the GIS, which most of it is. It's actually more rock outcroppings than slope, so the, the um, slope isn't as bad as GS would make it seem. It's just picking up kind of ledges of rock outcroppings. Um, so nonetheless, we've endeavored to place our development in uh, areas that avoid those steep slopes. Um, we have, we're aware of uh, several concerns from neighbors, uh, specifically around traffic and um, flooding issues as it relates to Mill Creek. Uh, flooding first. I. You know, I think as the past few days have shown us, flooding is going to be with us for the foreseeable future. Um, we have done, I worked our site plan in such a way to not encroach in either flood way or any water quality buffers. I'm staying out of the 75 foot uh, buffer from the floodway areas, which is shown by our um, kind of a boxed area there. We've stayed out of the buffers with our road network and have positioned it in such a way to avoid those. Um, traffic wise, uh, understand the concerns about traffic on Bluff Road. Um, Fortunately for this area, you know, and very much have heard the concerns about how tricky it is to turn from Bluff onto Nolensville, left on, from Bluff onto Nolensville. Um, this is part, this section of road is included in part of a TDOT plan that they expect to start in June. Um, not confirmed, not seen it, but heard rumblings that, that it's not only a road widening project will happen, but there's also strong consideration to installing a traffic signal uh, at the Bluff Nolensville intersection. Again, just rumor. Um, but, um, you know, as a state highway, the TDOT would have control of that. So, you know, I think TDOT is aware of the concerns uh, as it relates to traffic and is looking to address those in, in you know, in the capital project setting. Um, I, 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 just as an aside, personal aside, I also was, was pretty moved by the, um, by the presentation earlier and the, uh, um, you know, the goals sought to achieve both affordability and other things. You know, this is not on any type of scale. We're actually doing less than, than what's, currently zoned for it's not any type of scale of that project but you know we we do hope that this is a, a small piece in that that direction so we appreciate your consideration and uh, i'll reserve two minutes thank you sir appreciate you coming down reserve two minutes for rebuttal all right anyone wishing to speak in support of the project seeing none anyone wishing to speak in opposition come on up Everybody's got two minutes. Please state your name and address for the record, and we appreciate you coming down. Good evening. 
my friend is coming. There have been so many good speakers, and I have spasmodic dysphonia, so I'm not going to treat you to my voice. <laughs> but I live just a few hundred yards from that intersection where Bluff Road comes into Nolansville Road. I bought a condo three years ago um, out there, not knowing anything about that part of town. It has exploded, and the traffic is terrible on Nolansville Road. What amazes me is there is no traffic light where Bluff Road comes into Nolansville Road. I don't know why. Every day I see an almost accident there because the people coming out Bluff Road have no way to get onto Nolansville Road unless they can finally find a blank space. I'll let Steve talk. I'm Mary Leach, Sissy Leach. I've been practicing law in Nashville for 40 years. <laughs> anyway, I almost can't practice anymore because of this. Come on, Steve, Thank tell you. them about it. We'll start two minutes again here. For <laughs> oh, I get started over, okay. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, I'm Steve Nunn. I, I'm uh, an attorney too, and I'm very familiar with that location. And um, the uh, the traffic at the intersection of Bluff Road and Nolensville Road, especially in the morning and in the afternoon, what you would think of as rush hour or close to rush hour, is just it's unmanageable. It's unmanageable. And you frequently, in coming out of the condo, you can't turn left, which is what you may want to do. You have to turn right and go through a parking lot of a business and circle around that way. Um, it's just going to be, it seems to me, compounded by this development. And I understand, and I knew this before, that this is a, Nolensville Road is a state road. And, uh, and I've talked to some other attorneys who know a lot more about codes and zoning and so on than I do. But um, the state, as I understand, does have a plan to widen Nolensville Road and maybe to put a traffic light in. But uh, just like he said, I don't think anybody actually knows what the state's decision is going to be or when they're going to make it. And uh, I think everybody's interest would be better served if this was just deferred until we can get some uh, uh, indication or decision on what the state is going to do and when they're going to do it. Because I think if you approve this and, and do this development and and the traffic not just from bluff road but it's also coming from other directions and don't have a traffic signal that don't have a traffic signal there i think you're gonna wish you had done that <laughs> thank you sir appreciate it. anyone else wishing to speak up come on up welcome Thank you. My name is Carolyn Gerwin. I live at 814 Singleton Lane, which is just off the bottom of the picture there. Um, I had sent some uh, pictures in earlier. I hope you all saw them. Uh, it's just my attempt to kind of show what how slopey that is. I mean, it is a cliff and on Bluff Road. And today our street there, which is our access to come downtown, going down Bluff Road and then onto Nolansville Pike, um, was closed today due to flooding. Uh, there was a first responder sitting out there on the other side of the pond, um, and then uh, people could not go through. They were just turning around and turning around and turning around. I agree with the previous comments. The traffic on Nolansville Pike is is it's getting unbearable and it's very dangerous. When we come out to Nolansville Pike, uh, my husband and I will sit there and, and, and do the, you know, clear, 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 no, 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 you know. I mean, it is always your life in your hands situation. Um, so I agree with the idea of deferring until then. A couple of things I'd also like to bring up is if you looked at the pictures, you see that it's like a rock wall 
Then there's uh, Bluff Road, which has no shoulders, none. I mean, I almost, I was, it was dangerous for me to take those pictures. Um, and then there's Mill Creek. Mill Creek is a very important resource. Um, it's a beautiful creek. There's a Mill Creek Park further down. And um, it's also the only habitat, the only home of the Nashville crayfish, which is on the endangered species list. Um, this particular piece of property is pretty high up. And, oh, I'm sorry. And uh, we have a lot of wildlife, which is their last little patch of greenery there. Um, Ma'am, thank you. Sorry for... It's okay. Thank you. We appreciate it. Time goes, time flies when you're at the Planning Commission. It does. But this is the that last... That was one of my better years. Planning Commission jokes. I, <laughs> sorry. All right. Thank you very much. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? All right. Seeing none, rebuttal. Two minutes. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to acknowledge um, that we had the same concerns that um, the opposing, uh, those in opposition did as, as well, uh, related to the state, you know, the, on Nolensville. And I, part of our position in talking with Council Member Swope is, you know, the more advocacy for that um, project, the better. And so our position would be is, is the more people on Bluff Road in terms of people investing in it, the more advocacy there would be for a, a project to happen there. Um, I do want to note one thing that Logan mentioned um, that I didn't mention earlier that I think is important about Mill Creek. Part of the offsite improvements that we uh, will be doing per our traffic impact study are guardrails and things on that shoulder to kind of keep people out of, out of the Mill Creek area. That's, that's part of the recommendations of our traffic impact study. Um, so I did want to note that as well. Um, that I'll leave it there and thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Councilman, come on up. Thank you, Thanks for... Be brief. I'm supposed to be at a traffic calming meeting 30 minutes ago. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm Robert Swope, for those of you who don't know me. There's a few new commissioners since the last time we all met live. And thank you so much for your service. Bless you. We're going to miss you. Um, what hasn't been said... I will say, I was with both deputy commissioners of TDOT yesterday for three hours discussing Nolensville Road, which was pulled off the shelf five years ago, dusted off, was funded by this city, and was funded by the state. They have spent the better part of four years buying easements and right-of-ways, as you can well imagine. Uh, they are down to one very small, slight argument with a dentist that is going to be resolved in the next two weeks, and I have been assured and promised, granted verbally, uh, that the expansion of Nolansville to five lanes will begin June 1. So, with that said, I also, knowing this commission meeting was tonight, I asked the deputy commissioner, what are the chances of getting a traffic light at Bluff Road? And he said, actually, they're better than you think, because we're already planning on it. Knowing full well that Bluff Road is the next point of development, whether we all want it to happen or not, and whether it's in Davidson or Williamson County, because everything south of that line is Williamson County, um, with all due respect to our neighbors, uh, Bluff Road, you can't widen it. Mill Creek's on one side, there's a rock wall on the other. You can't put a sidewalk on it, a bike lane's going to be impossible, so the applicant has completely agreed to putting in guardrails which the city should have done a long time ago, by the way, but the applicant's gonna do it. So I ask that you approve this without a deferral. Um, it will be, <laughs> let me guess, a year before you guys start building? Yeah, Nolansville Road will probably be widened by the time anybody actually moves onto this property. So a deferral doesn't make any sense. Um, the applicant has already mentioned that this has already been rezoned once about four years ago. I think, what do we call that, 2 BC before COVID? <laughs> Sorry, it's late. Um, it was already rezoned for, I want to say 225 homes. 242. So <laughs> when the applicant came to me and wanted to put it in an SP, I said, make it under 200. Let's just start there. So they came in at 182, which I thought was quite a concession. 
uh, and, and it also works with the topography of the land. So again, I ask your approval tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. <coughs> Seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. And Commissioner Sims, your last hearing. Why don't you go first? Oh, gee, thanks. <laughs> I, um, I actually found this one confusing. I did go out and look at it, and you're absolutely right. You've got a creek on one side and steep on the other side, and there's just, and it was raining really hard, and it was really frightening just to go down this road. So the idea that we only have one entry into this place, um, if I'm reading this correctly, is troublesome to me because, um, particularly for safety fire, those kinds of things. So I'm not sure what that means, but I, I don't like that it just has one entry, particularly given Bluff Road and what it looks like right now. The other is I'm, we did get a lot of really meaningful letters. I mean, some that had put a lot of thought into these things and some real concerns that are here. And I have, my record shows that when the neighborhood really has these kinds of concerns and there's a lot more than a few of them and there's many of them coming in, then I think we have to listen. And I, I think some of the concerns have to do with this traffic, and I know there's maybe promises, but the other thing is I'm not quite sure why we're doing an S, and this is my, why we're doing an SP instead of a subdivision, kind of with the conservation, the new conservation policies we have. And that's just a question. Well, one thing, Lisa, I think it would be helpful to describe some of the department's history with mm -hmm. this sure. with this land. We um, one thing I will, we struggled with this one a bit, obviously, because we do very much care about the conservation areas. I think Lisa can answer the question about fire. This is a down zoning, and so um, for us. Um, you know, maybe this was a bit of an oversimplistic view, but we we initially recommended disapproval of the other rezoning, but it went forward anyway. And so um, I think, Lisa, if you can share some of the sure. backstory and how you were thinking about this particular project, it might be helpful. Sure. So when the original rezoning came through a few years ago for the RS-10 and the RM-4, staff and the Planning Commission both actually recommended disapproval. At that time, we were encouraging of an SP. And the reason that we were encouraging of an SP is because we could do some things that we may not even be able to do with the subdivision, frankly, um, is set things like limits of disturbance, which we've done with this SP. Um, and so this is a reduction in the number of units that could currently be built. And with the SP, you will see the way that the units have been sculpted on the site, and that's intentional and works with the contours and is done in a way that minimizes grading, minimizes clearing, minimizes tree removal. And some of those things we might not have been able to achieve under our current um, subdivision regulations um, or any of our current, I mean, our current regulations. And so this actually sort of allows us to sculpt the plan in a way that is more protective of the property. Um, we did have concerns as well related to the access. This is uh, sort of a uniquely situated site. And uh, Logan, I don't know if you can go to our aerial. Uh, one more, there. Um, so this is sort of a uniquely situated site, if you look at it, in that there's an SP that's approved to the north, um, and then you have a, a subdivision approved to the south, and there it's, it's really sort of landlocked in that trying to get a second access is nearly impossible. We pushed them to try to find a way to get a second access. Uh, we had them work with fire. I believe that all of the units will have to be sprinkled. Um, because of the one access, but fire has approved it. Um, we push to get an access, but sometimes our ability to, to get those things is limited by ownership of property or access or other things that have already been built that have created a certain pattern. Um, there was a TIS that was performed. Um, this is essentially a reduction in the number of trips that could be generated under the existing zoning. Um, but they did prepare a TIS and there are some 
limited improvements that are required with that approval of the TIS. And so this one was a bit unusual. Um, it's probably closer to what we had encouraged to be done the first round, um, but we've ended up with, I think, fewer units than even would have been proposed with an SP that we might have seen a couple of years ago. Um, and so um, staff has really pushed this applicant um, to be as minimally disturbing as possible to the land. Thank you, that's really good. I think the other question I have is, do we have any kind of regulations when you get this close to another, do we have regional guidelines or anything that happens? I know some of the concerns actually came from residents in Williamson County concerned about this. And so we will typically, if something, we have some places where we've actually got property that crosses over county lines. And in those cases, we will work closely with our counterparts in those um, communities. Um, in cases like this, I, I believe that, I know that Williamson County sort of looked at this plan, but the regulating uh, authority is, is, is ours alone. But Lisa, so stormwater would look at the environmental features and make sure that they meet local and state guidelines as well, if that, if that answers your question. It, they're probably not as protective as we would want, candidly, you know, so. Um, I, this one just kind of confuses me, so I really want to listen to my colleagues. Commissioner Henley. Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, one of my phrases that I say a lot, and I, you know, I think it's important here too to start out with it is, you know, I think it's important to not punish private development for public deficiencies. And I think I took, uh, I took the time to actually go to the site and for the first time in a long time, taking that route beyond Lennox Village, because I usually stop there and eat. <laughs> um, so I actually went a little bit further and my stomach growled as I was passing a couple restaurants, but I experienced exactly what was mentioned by um, those who spoke in opposition here, that it is, it is a version of a nightmare in terms of traffic. Um, I have the fortunate um, you know, opportunity to live a much, much closer to town, and, and so I've become a little bit more insulated to some of the traffic concerns, people that live a lot further out. Um, and so for me, it was extremely harsh to just sit there and, and, and deal with that. Um, I knew it was for the purposes that I was doing it for, but I, I could only imagine what that's like on a daily basis, so I, I definitely, um, those complaints and those concerns resonate with me. Um, and then I did, I took the drive down um, Bluff Road and, and the, the pictures that were sent, I think were, were helpful. And, but even though you still have to drive it to understand it um, and understand how you really don't have anywhere to expand because a lot of my concerns initially were um, ones that I think um, Dr. Sims expressed. One was the one entry point and just thinking about that road. But um, I saw that there were some conditions related to having sprinklers and honestly being a part of projects that have died um, during the time frame of trying to acquire property adjacent, I know how difficult that can be, and, and some of these properties and parcels are a lot larger and already have SPs and plans in place for them. So I'm, I'm glad that we got to this point without that being a, a specific barrier. Um, and I saw that the, the fire marshal had asked for sprinklers for all of the units, so I'm assuming that's their way of addressing some of their concerns. The other thing that, again, concerned me was um, you know, how to, how to navigate from the topography of the site, but that's a development challenge, and so glad that somebody's willing to take that on, and it looks like there's a lot of respect um, to the areas in the, in the floodplain. I, could, I saw a lot of um, green, so I know there was a, a lot of um, thought towards the conservation, and so I would agree that planning has really worked to create a, a plan that I think is as respectful as possible to what's there, um, and to still allow and encourage development. Um, and then again, to a council member who, who stayed and waited and, and, and gave their, their, their compliments about what's happened and comments about what's going on and advocating for, for the things that are happening. I know it's even more tough when you've got um, people continuously complain about traffic and you say you want to bring more homes, but we need more homes. Um, and traffic's not going to go away if this development doesn't happen. So I think it's important to push for those type of infrastructure solutions. So I say all that to say I think um, you know, I, I, I understand a lot of the concerns that were there. I think with natural, um, you know, factors as well as some of the things that are there with infrastructure, there's only so much that can be done. Um, I saw a lot of the traffic calculations and things like that. And again, a lot of people live with that traffic now. If there's a solution coming, 
Um, hopefully it improves and, and mitigates a lot of what's been experienced right now because it's bad. And then in the future, hopefully we'll look forward and be happy that we approved this now and that those homes are there to take advantage of those infrastructure improvements. So, Thank you. Councilman? Thank you, Chair. Um, I, too, included this as part of my site visits over the weekend, and I've never been down Holt Road before, so definitely been to Linux Village, but uh, never been to Holt Road, or to Bluff Road, rather. So, um, so it, uh, appreciate the letters uh, and the comments from the neighbors further down the street. Uh, you know, again, my, my experience of the street uh, uh, validated those concerns, certainly. Um, but, you know, things that are important to, to me and uh, that we hear a lot about uh, are preserving trees and slopes and things like that in the city and uh, particularly in some of these areas where we have undeveloped land that has a lot of topography. And one of the things that I'm impressed by with this plan is the amount of thought that's gone into that, which I don't know that you would get uh, with a, a straight subdivision. Um, even as we're trying to improve subdivision regulations in some ways, it's just this, this plan gets, provides more benefit environmentally, I believe, than uh, the straight subdivision regulations would. And um, I think that's very persuasive. It's, there's a great uh, amount of trees. It looks like a lot of trees will be saved on this site. Hopefully, you'll still have a tree-lined road, which is a beautiful road to drive down, actually. Um, uh, and then adding the guardrail uh, along the creek will add some visual clutter, but definitely add some safety. Uh, there, so I, I think that when you factor in that the base zoning allows more units than this allows, and this plan is so thoughtful uh, in the way that it approaches the topography and the environment and Mill Creek and the species in Mill Creek, uh, all those things have been thought through, uh, and so I'm inclined to support the staff recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner Jones. Commissioner Jones. Commissioner Jones. Thank you, Chair. Uh, but. Thank you for the history of this site. I was just looking up uh, what was originally, I, it kind of refreshed my memory. It was, I think, originally L2A, and then uh, because of really difficult site with uh, lots of slopes and so forth, and that time, uh, Planning Commission recommended disapproval, uh, but at the council level, uh, L2A2 became uh, RM4. So I think, so in that sense, yes, I understand, you know, uh, this current SP is, yes, down zoning, but uh, L2A2, you know, RM4 just happened three years ago. And so it was not in a sense down zoning per se because it's the same you know property and the same condition and same restriction and same you know difficulty so i do have a little bit you know now i know the history i do you know reflect more uh, concern so if i may i would like to ask uh, you said i think it was told non disturbance area do you have uh, can you bring up the picture and uh, can you uh, specify which area is not touched? Um, so it's going to be very difficult to see on the screen here, but there is a thin line that goes around the entire site here that identifies the limit of disturbance. Um, there are blow-up sheets that show uh, more zoomed-in perspectives of the site plan here with the slopes showing the limit of disturbance, but it, uh, it's a thin line around the site. So if you if you look at, I, I can tell you a place where you can find it and then you can sort of follow it around. We are unable to point, to use pointer on the screen. So if you look at um, the top two uh, green areas where there's stormwater, you can see a black line running just to the north of that, a solid black line that then if you that then you can follow all the way around and you'll see it sort of sculpting and going around the units behind the units. Um, did you find it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that is the limit of disturbance line. And so if it's outside of that, it won't be disturbed, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. In 
in a way, so I'm kind of following in the middle section, you know, red represent a really uh, slope uh, greater than 20 degrees, I believe. So that area is uh, totally undisturbed. Totally undisturbed. So even though, you know, sometimes you no know, disturbance are meaning, uh, you know, pipe, sewage line, or, you know, those electric line has to come through, but even those are not disturbed. Right, it's, it is limited to that area that is outlined okay. in that line, yeah. For that, yes, I can see it's a much, much improved <laughs> specific plan because this difficulty area and uh, not literally disturbance, I really appreciate that effort. Uh, so I think my uh, next concern is, uh, I think a fire department is already uh, weighed on, but it, you know, when we are discussing uh, subdivision regulation, uh, the internal street longer than 750 feet is subject to uh, secondary access or additional uh, fire safety. So in this uh, you know, uh, plan, I believe everything is closed up and it seems like it, we may have to give some kind of variance for that 750 feet. Uh, fire requirement. So, Could you talk to me so about that's that? a requirement of the subdivision regulations, but this isn't actually a subdivision. These are private drives, and so they are not subject to that um, length restriction. Um, and there are other restrictions for multifamily um, in regards to fire access, which um, they are meeting with the sprinklers of the buildings. So I believe that to ha you have to have two at, it's, I, I can't recall the exact number where you have to have two, but um, with the sprinklers, you are allowed to get up to, I think 200 with, with one access if it's sprinkled. Okay. Uh, thirdly, uh, the last thing I do appreciate, uh, the last email, I have seen uh, actually the flood crossing the Bluff Road. I mean, I do appreciate, you know, Commissioner Henley's comment because it's a natural occurrence. You know, we cannot punish for that natural hazard for this development, but we are having such a kind of freaky weather so every time you know when it's rain you know developer cannot improve entire bluff road and so how would flooding unable to cross that section of course it may be just once a year but once a year is one too many so that's my uh, little concern and reservation but other than that, I think I do appreciate, you know, sensitivity and, you know, all the um, improvement compared to current uh, zoning. Uh, so that sense, I do appreciate that. But, you know, for the entryway and safety and natural uh, geographical uh, constraint, I, I have a little bit of uh, reservation. Thank you. Commissioner Blackshe. Um, staff and the councilmen were both very helpful in providing information about both the history and hopefully the future of the area with those improvements coming on Nolansville Pike. Um, I like the plan. I mean, there's obviously parts of it that are not, um, the area just is not the best area um, to develop, but, uh, and I understand what you were saying, Commissioner Johnson, about the history and, and what the zoning is and has been, but I guess technically the proposal here is a reduction in the allowable units. So if all the concerns relate to density, really, right, the traffic and the people coming down the road and um, unfortunately the proximity to the creek and, and species they may live there, it's all related to density. And if this um, results in a decrease in the density that's allowable, then it seems like it would be a win, maybe, you know, not out the park because of the constraints of the area, but certainly um, I think a plan that's suitable for us to approve. So I would be in favor of approval. Commissioner Tibbs. Uh, to um, um, pretty much echo all of my fellow commissioners as far as the, 
you know, the extra egress that, you know, understanding the reason why we we're not able to get that, but understand the, the thought process went into it. Um, but, you know, really the, uh, uh, the councilman's kind of wrap up was, was a perfect wrap up <laughs> because that was kind of the, the biggest issues. And I uh, appreciate the work that he did to, uh, to probably a bigger picture than just this development actually, but you know, it actually encompassed it and, and will benefit it. So um, I am in favor and uh, with that, make a motion to approve staff recommendation. Well, oh, we, have, sorry, we have Commissioner Haynes. Commissioner, have Commissioner Haynes, 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 you've been mistreated Sims. tonight. Man, Man, don't, don't forget me. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Haynes. So um, the developer could build more units under an older plan and we haven't no more control under base zoning and with an SP we do have control so I think this is the much better result for us we obviously didn't like it four years ago when we turned it down and now we've got another bite of the apple and it's a better plan so with that I will move approval of staff's recommendation that's proper motion is there a second there's a proper second any more discussion seeing none all in favor say aye aye opposed no ayes have it it's approved. So now we are on to other business. And we have historic. Anything on historic, Mr. Johnson? Uh, thanks, Chair. I would like to comment just uh, briefly. Uh, historic landmark overlay. Uh, we, as a history commission, is so excited about we are recommending and adding uh, more uh, historic landmark. You know, last meeting, uh, we added exit in, and then today, we uh, added uh, Kirkwood, yes, uh, the Mary Berry Bus House. And also, uh, at the last meeting, uh, at the Historic Zoning Commission, uh, this one was, did not come to uh, Planning Commission because it was 518 Russell interior only. Uh, so that interior is a charge. Uh, the development team is working really hard to preserve really nice interior. So interior become historic landmark overlay. And then when the development is completed, it will be accessible to public. So I am very, very uh, excited to share those uh, wonderful news and really appreciate you know, planning and staff and historic staff working together to make this happen. Thank you, Commissioner Parks, Commissioner Haynes. So we have just started a working committee um, that stemmed from disabled kids playing baseball in Warner Parks and has now broadened into studying equity across all of our parks geographically to include physical handicaps, the mentally disabled, um, where we have park deserts in our city. So it's a very important working committee. I think it's gonna take us a long time because we, we need to be more equitable in how we serve everyone in our city. Um, so that's an important initiative that's underway. Thank you, Commissioner. And Director, we don't have any uh, thing on the executive committee. So Director, anything, any updates? So we have a work session um, that is currently planned in March 20, 22nd. And one of the things that we're going to talk about, I'm glad Angie um, Hubbard stayed, um, is the new housing team that we are working on uh, at planning. Um, we are seeding it. So we're building a foundation. I'm glad that the first agenda item, there was a lot of discussion. I heard you, Commissioner, um, uh, what are the tools that we can use? And, and Angie and the team are really thinking that through. Um, she's really challenged because it's not just tools that the planning department or the planning commission might need, but it's it's really metro-wide. It's a metro-wide division um, that, that she's building, and I'm really proud of the work that's going on so far. But I look forward to to sharing that. We'll provide an update on the East Bank and an update on some of the work um, downtown that we have been uh, considering at your urging. I would also finally say um, we are uh, publicly vetting the conservation 
um, subdivision uh, plans that I do think will strengthen protection of areas like this. We didn't have those available when the rezonings came through. Um, Councilwoman Henderson is going to work with us and uh, Councilman Weathers and others at Council. Um, and so we look forward to bringing you the update. Um, as is typical, we've been trying to get the community, developers, and environmental stewards in our community on the same page. Not everybody's exactly happy preview, but I think everybody acknowledges the work we've done. And so if we'd made everyone happy, I'm not sure we would have done anything. So it's not going to be just, you know, um, you know, it's, all, it's, not, it's not always the easiest. But anyway, it's been a great process. And so that's my update. Thank you. Thank you, Director, and I always appreciate the collaboration amongst those groups, and it's an, it's an important balance for yeah. the city, and I know the commissioners appreciate it, too. All right, uh, legislative update, uh, Councilman. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, appreciate the comments from Commissioner Johnston about 518 Russell. I'm really excited working with the uh, community to do. The building is already uh, preserved externally by the Edgefield Historic Preservation Zoning District. We're wanting to do an adaptive reuse, and so uh, the applicant is working on a neighborhood landmark. And I really suggested, I'm like, hey, why don't we try this new tool, which is the historic interiors? And it's been really exciting to see the staff work with the applicant. Um, <clears throat> I'm looking forward to the, we have some community meetings that are coming up uh, after the historic recommendation was received for that valuable feedback. I'm looking forward to bring that back before the commission in two meetings, so stay tuned for that. Otherwise, just want to, again, reiterate, I appreciate our staff for all the hard work. Um, Mr. Greg Claxton and others are presently hard at work uh, on the capital improvements budget uh, prioritization process that uh, all, all 39 of us are submitting stuff for. So I uh, just want to, again, thank the staff for their very hard work to help us make the best decisions we can for this. Thank city. you. Thank so, you. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman. And so, Commissioner Sims, Dr. Sims, we will miss you very, very much. Why don't you make the last motion to adjourn? And I would like to just say one thing. Yes. I, one of my favorite authors is A. Um, a. Milne, who are Winnie's, Winnie the Pooh, and it says, how lucky I am to have something that makes saying goodbye so hard. And I have been so blessed to be part of you guys, to have learned so much about our city. To, and I think you have to sit on this side of the desk to understand how hard this really is. And how often the burden of knowing we can't please everybody, that some people are going to get hurt in really hard decisions, that burden to me I found just so hard. And I know you carry it much more gracefully than I could. So I'm grateful for you. And I'm so grateful the last five years I've learned so much, even when we disagree on most things. <laughs> so thank you for letting me be among you. I will pray for you to have God's wisdom and strength as you continue to serve our city. So make the motion to adjourn. Oh, I make the motion to adjourn. Uh, we're adjourned. <laughs>